um, if there's no objection, uh, we'll take Katie first and then we'll jump into the, uh, the two meteor items if that's okay. Is there any objection? Hearing what, none. What is the time frame? Um, she has to get I, gotta, I gotta jump off early myself. What time do you have to get out, Karen? Um, right after the Kingsland. Right after the Kingsland. Okay. Um, well, let's see. I have 15 minutes for the discussion uh, for Katie. Um, Katie, I think we can keep to that 15 minutes. And I don't expect, um, um, I don't think we're actually going to need a full 30 minutes on the, um, the, or we can, we can bump up Kingsland actually, if that if nobody has an objection to that, I'm sorry to move the schedule around. This is Ryan. I don't object. Okay. Katie, can we do this in 15 minutes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. <laughs> Thank you. I okay. know it, it works well because it's very, it's very, um, um, integrated with the Kingsland conversation. So if they're back to back, that would be great. Okay. Uh, Katie go. Okay. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen, um, as, essentially for visuals, but before I do, I just wanted to give context, um, uh, you know, I was inspired um, by the last meeting um, and the presentation that Willis gave because the issues that are taking place um, on Kingsland that were discussed are very similar, um, as I brought up then, to uh, the issues we've been having near under the Cambridge Park. And so uh, with that, I just kind of wanted to share um, some photos, if I'm able to. Great. Um, it's not going to let me share. Okay. Um, you, you should be able to share, Jerry or uh, no? It's Joanna? because it's because I'm on my browser. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm not on Firefox. Um, so, Lynn, are you on by any chance? My colleague, Lynn Del Sol, uh, was on as well, and she was helping me prepare. At any rate, um, as I figure that out, um, if for those of you who are um, familiar with Under the Cambridge Park, um, it is a uh, seven acre open space that was opened um, in 2019 after several years of um, community conversations. Um, it's a really unique project that combines uh, state DOT with my organization, the North Brooklyn Parks Alliance. Um, it was a, um, uh, when I say community driven, uh, there were a number of visioning sessions during a two year design period that included both in-person um, charrettes as well as uh, in-person tours, um, as well as a community opening at which time the framework was announced. Um, and shared with the, the community. And the reason I bring that up is because throughout that time, what we heard from the community was A, it was really important to have open space. Um, it, they were very excited at the opportunity for seven additional acres of open space. Um, and that this was such a unique location being under the Kosciuszko Bridge, um, that it also was a place to be activated through programs and events ranging from, let's say, musical concerts to recreation that you couldn't see in other spaces. Um, and um, uh, it again, it was a state project. Um, and so we had wonderful support from our state leaders, um, Joe Lentil in particular at the time. Um, and we were able to uh, get it done and actually built in a, um, um, uh, I don't want to say unprecedented because I don't know if that's true, but it certainly seemed very fast in the middle of a, the pandemic. Um, so we opened in June 2019. And all of that's kind of important context because, um, you know, it's in a heavily, heavily industrial area. So alongside places like Kingsland Wildflowers um, or Gateway to Greenpoint, um, you have these ideas for new open spaces that are being placed in unusual locations. 
Um, and you have uh, in this place in particular, because it's a destination and because we feel a mandate to program it heavily, we are attracting a number of people to the site. And so what we're seeing is a large, um, um, uh, um, I, I, I'll just say battle between um, the public and the industrial um, activity that's happening down there. Um, and so Lynn, are you on yet? Are you able to? Um, okay. So uh, I, it's important to show the, the photos because what, what we're seeing um, and what we've been requesting from City DOT is things that will allow us to attract large numbers of people there um, in a safe way. That's number one. And number two is um, to get sanitation there so that um, able to actually have clean streets. Um, because going to the first issue, um, last year we had you know upwards of a thousand people per event um, uh, for special events. And then on, on a day-to-day -day basis, we have um, attracted a large number of folks using wheels. Um, by that, I mean, we have kids on scooters, we have teenagers on skateboarders, we have droves of women on uh, roller skates, um, we have um, uh, BMX bikers. It's very, it's designed for those types of users. Um, so they're not only walking to the site, but they're using these um, scooters, skateboards, bicycles to get there. And what's happening is that they're crossing the streets um, and the streets are, um, overrun with trucks. So visibility crossing the streets is not as very, very poor. Um, we have abandoned flatbeds at the intersections of each of the park. Um, we don't have any signs anywhere around the entire park, except for one street in front of waste management. And what's happening with that is you have um, abandoned, um, uh, abandoned trucks you have uh, folks who are using their trucks uh, for illegal dumping, or in some cases, they're just washing their vehicles at the steps or some cases inside of the park vicinity, um, which sounds like, okay, they shouldn't be doing that. But what's happening is that these trucks are coming from um, heavily industrial areas that are potentially handling hazardous and toxic materials. And so in some cases in between our park parcels, you have upwards of eight to 12, and we know this because we've measured eight to 12 inches of some sort of, uh, I don't wanna say dirt, because I don't think it's dirt, some sort of material that is piling up um, because the streets haven't been cleaned and because uh, the businesses surrounding the site are using the open spaces for cleaning, dumping, um, and essentially abandoning vehicles. Some of those vehicles have blown up and melted and have stayed there for weeks at a time. Some of those vehicles have been left there for a year and a half or more. Some of them leave flatbeds and then drive away, leaving the flatbeds there in the middle of the sidewalk in between um, the two walkways going in. So again, low, very little visibility. Um, I, I have two small children, um, and so to get, you know, on scooters, I've had my heart drop a number of times because, you, you, you know, they're scooting in one section and they want to cross the street to the other section and you can't see because there are flatbeds um, in the crosswalks. And before you have a chance to go around the trucks to see, uh, another truck is coming this way. And so I think I, I, think I heard Karen on the call. Um, you know, we've, we have spoken to Karen um, I, we're very, we, we don't want to interrupt the businesses in the surrounding area. We want to work with them, but at the same time, we are begging, um, to have signage being placed around the park. Um, what we've requested and what the pr local precinct has also put in a, a work order for or a request for is, um, at least no parking at nighttime on, um, on Stewart Avenue. We also think it's very important on Gardner Avenue. This is between Cherry and Scott. Um, this is one of the most egregious, essentially there are three, three public streets that intersect a seven acre park. 
there is no signage on any of those streets. And so the streets are completely congested with nearly abandoned vehicles, which makes it difficult to, to cross in between Park, park B. And so um, what we are, again, requesting is signage because we've been working with NYPD and there's no enforcement. And the reason that there's no enforcement is because there's no signs. They can't ticket because there are no signs. No one can tow because there's no ticket. Um, and sanitation won't come because there's no street regulations making, um, you know, like I said, nearly a foot of, of waste. Um, but what I think is probably hazardous waste in the streets that we're walking over. Um, I mean, we can't sweep it. It's, it's so dense at, at, that it needs to be shoveled. But that's actually outside of our jurisdiction. But, you know, in order to keep the public safe, we um, we have to clean it. Um, and so I, you know, thank you, Rhonda. I'm glad you're joining. I, I'd love to understand how to move forward and, and make this place safe because we have, you know, we have maybe, you know, a few, a few, um, I would say probably about 15,000 people visit last season. Um, and we're, this season we're probably expecting upwards of 100,000 because of the level of programming we're going to be doing. And I want to make sure as we invite those people to the space, um, they will be safe. Um, and I know our, the DOT commissioner at the time, uh, Commissioner Gutman was there last, last year. Um, he said that they would act quickly. I know DOT was there surveying. Um, I, I saw them there, but they were there actually when the park was closed because we were preparing for events. Um, and so, um, Rhonda, I'd love to, to hear from you about how we can move forward. Sure. So there, there's a lot to, I don't want to miss anything. So regarding a request for uh, like no standing overnight, um, it, I could follow up on that if if PD uh, submitted a request for that. Is, you know, if, they submitted a request. They submitted a request for that last summer. So Rhonda, right. I had I remember I ran into you in the park one yes, day. Of course I did. Mm -hmm. It was because PD had just put that order in, but that was a year ago, and I haven't heard anything since. Okay. Well, um, I mean, do you know who specifically? Maybe you could have that person reach out to me directly. Um, because... It was the ninety. So I think it was, you know, uh, Captain Fahey at the time. So Deputy Inspector Fahey. I don't know if she's on the call, but. Okay, well, if whoever put it in specifically, if they could follow up with me so I could get the paper trail and find out what happened to that. I'm happy to do it. We definitely need a request from someone to make that happen um, for no for like overnight regulations. You're talking about no standing or no parking. Right. I mean, our preference is no standing, um, but, um, you know, I, I think like the PD had asked for no overnight. So at the very least, we could address the abandoned vehicles. Well, I mean, abandoned vehicles could be addressed anyway, because commercial vehicles aren't allowed to park anywhere for more than three hours at a time. No, I understand. They're like actively loading and unloading. So those. Those vehicles could be ticketed. They could be towed. You can't leave a car parked anywhere in the city for more than seven days. You know, of course, it's illegal. Because, but as Deputy Fahey said last time right, with Kingsland, she doesn't have the capacity to have her staff sit there for three hours. And so without signs, she really can't enforce. I don't want to speak on behalf of the PD, but that's what she had said last time. Well, when you... The one truck that I saw there that's been there for months, if you don't have to sit there for, for three hours, you can just come back the next day and it's still there. But, um, but, but, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that I could, as long as I have a request to follow up on, I, I, there's a good chance I could get no standing overnight regulations. What hours are you thinking? Um, I mean, again, our preference is no standing at all on Stewart. Gardner uh, and Scott. What hours? No standing. What hours? 24. 24. No standing anytime? No standing anytime. So you don't want people to be able to park there during the day? No. You don't want park goers to be able to park there? Yeah, I mean, on those particular streets, um, it is, it is, it has been a big problem. We're Wait, talking about it's Stuart, it's Stuart Gardner. And what was the third one? Scott. 
in between Cherry and Stewart. Those are the three, There, it's three blocks, Stewart, Cherry, sorry, um, Gardner, Stewart, Stewart, Gardner, and Scott. You know what? I think what would be best is you could, um, you should email me with this, okay? And then I could coach you to put the request in through our, uh, through our website, all right? So we know that can happen instead of talking about, you know, we can move forward. I, I could get what you're asking for and the specific uh, streets and the limits on those streets. But, cool. But, but just to be clear, if you're looking for no standing anytime, you don't want park goers to be able to park there. Well, again, this is just one block in between the three so it's only it's only the one block that intersects the park. So just to be clear, yeah. it's Gardner between Cherry and Scott. It's Gardner. Correct. No, it's Gardner between Cherry and Thomas. Oh, Gardner between Thomas. The other street is actually unmapped. The nearest street would be Anthony. Correct. So it's I'm sorry. I had we had a map, but I'm not able to share it. So I apologize. Okay. I, we had so the unmapped. So I'm. Um, I can't really hear it, so you're going to need to. All that's on that block, uh, traditionally or commonly, is basically one to two rigs. So what we have is two rigs parking on our our cross streets. So that's Stewart, that's Gardner. Scott is truly not a parkable street, yet they do it anyway. Large cement trucks park there that are about 45 to 25 feet in length. These box trucks, these box rigs, are blocking all sight lines for several feet into the street. So for now, we think the exchange of our park goers who do not really come to this park with a car, they're mostly on foot or on bicycle, they're, the exchange of their safety versus them showing up in a car, I will take that. So I would, we would prefer no standing anytime as is what's established on Waste Management Street of Thomas. All of Thomas has no parking or no standing anytime. And that's also to facilitate those box trucks and those trailers to actually drive on those streets and make those turns safely because oftentimes they're side swiping smaller parked vehicles or crashing into our fences or <laughs> our light posts or many other objects that are in their way. So honestly, to facilitate both the businesses around us to have access of their drivers to drive there, we think it's beneficial to them. And for our park users who are traditionally not in a car, um, it's beneficial to them. The only few people who would suffer are the handful of uh, workers in the area who do use it for small car parking. Um, but there is honestly quite a bit of parking in that area for those people to find closer sure. to or anyone that was like disabled would also not be able to park there. Um, I mean, but, but listen, since Eric wants to keep this moving along again, I just want to reiterate just um, if you can send me an email with the with the streets. You know, I, I don't want this request to be coming from me. I want it to be coming from you. I need the paper trail. Okay. So send me the locations, the street that's unmapped. We probably cannot sign. We're, we're not. Not going to sign that's D that's, that's DOT. So that's state DOT, and state DOT um, is going to be clearing that street out as well. Um, but Rhonda, so what's the timing? Because our season, we our programming starts Memorial Day weekend. So if we put in those orders now, can this can the signs be up in the next month? I I, I it's that's not within my control. I certainly can promise that. I could not promise that. But um, let's get it started as soon as possible. Okay, so um, I, I, I do have to move this along. So let's just say next steps are Katie or Lynn, or both of you will contact Rhonda with specific requests, as well as communications between, um, uh, oh, I almost said OSA, uh, the Parks Alliance and um, the 9-4, and get those to Rhonda as well, please. And then we'll, um, we'll follow up over the month before the next uh, board meeting. But if you're looking for sanitation to clean, 
Yeah. If you want cleaning regulations, right? You got to deal. You got to talk to sanitation about that, and that request has to come from them to us, and we can do those signs. Almost a year and a half now. That's why we're coming to you, you all, for assistance, maybe, and moving that request along. Right. So, so that's fine. So so, send me that email tomorrow. If there was a chat, I would put my email address in the chat, but the chat isn't available. I think. I, I can but, forward that to. To, I think they have it. I mean, so, I think um, Katie has my email address, but yeah. Katie, you're muted. Katie, you're muted. I said, um, I've emailed Rhonda this before, so I have her email address. But thank you. And Eric, I just want to also say thank you for letting me go um, uh, ahead of the agenda. I appreciate it. No problem. Okay. Um, all right, and we can uh, we can follow up on this at the at the next uh, transportation committee meeting, but uh, hopefully we'll have some follow up that I can put in the report for the. For the May uh, report. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, closing that item and moving to item back to item one. Or would we rather do uh, Kingsland Avenue? I'm I'm sorry to. Did you this. just say Kingsland Avenue was going to be next? Yeah, we can we can do Kingsland Avenue next if there's no objection. I'm sorry to for the uh, agency folks that are. <laughs> looking at an agenda thinking they're they're leaving but um yeah if we could do kingsland next i think that would be best if there's no objection from the committee all right hearing none let's do uh kingsland avenue um preston yes or Rhonda, you want to introduce preston again or however is best go ahead Sure. I'm Ron DeMesser from New York City Department of Transportation, Brooklyn Borough Commissioner's Office. I'm the liaison for this community board for quite some time. Uh, Preston Johnson is uh, joining us today, and he's going to give a presentation on a uh, proposed uh, project that includes a bike lane and a pedestrian path. And so I'm just going to go ahead in the interest of Keeping things moving along, going to turn it over to Preston. Thank you, Preston. Okay, thank you, Rhonda. Um, let me uh, share this if possible. Um, hmm. Okay, share. Just one moment. Okay, can you see that? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, uh, as Rhonda mentioned, my name is Preston Johnson. I'm project manager with the uh, bike program at uh, New York City Department of Transportation. And just following up on last month's presentation, uh, uh, talking about ways to improve uh, Kingsland Avenue, uh, we, are, we have um, a proposal that we'd like to share with you. So uh, the project area, while uh, last month, a lot of the focus was north of uh, Greenpoint Avenue, uh, we want to, it's the goal of the bicycle program to ensure that uh, we're creating a network of, uh, of bike lanes that are usable. So we are actually proposing to extend this down to Meeker Avenue. Uh, this is coming in the context of some other planned projects um, on McGinnis Boulevard, on Meeker Avenue, um, and on Review Avenue, sort of surrounding the area. Uh, background, as I mentioned, the Newtown Creek Nature Walk Phase 3 uh, has recently opened, and that access is on Kingsland Avenue. And uh, last, last month, we heard... Uh, the interesting proposal from the uh, Newtown Creek Alliance about uh, adding bike connections, adding better pedestrian connections. Uh, and this uh, also, however, it's uh, a heavy industrial area. There's a truck route in between um, uh, Norman and Greenpoint Avenue on Kingsland Avenue. Uh, and uh, so these are things that we need to balance. Uh, and uh, I. I hope that this proposal uh, sort of meets some of those goals for you. Uh, we see about four different main issues in this area. Uh, as I was just saying, the industrial issues are are really primary. I mean, I think 
the trucks and heavy uh, vehicles, um, they're necessary to the operations of these, uh, these industries, these businesses that are on Kingsland Avenue. Uh, but at the same time, they can pose some some threats to pedestrians and people riding bikes, as we're seeing a growing number of those people uh, going to the, the nature walk. And uh, the current um, the current lack of street markings, I think, really kind of uh, adds to those problems. Another problem that we heard about was the uh, the illegal truck storage uh, on Kingsland Avenue, and I. It's causing a problem where it makes it difficult for uh, people that have a need to uh, to come to the area, to park in the area. They're not able to get parking. And we hope that this project uh, addresses that illegal uh, truck storage and provides more parking for uh, people that uh, sort of deserve the parking there. Another thing we heard about was pedestrian access. Um, as you can see in that top photograph, uh, we heard a complaint that the lighting was um, inadequate. But I think what you might see is that you know you had you do have that light pole that's cut off and kind of blocking the uh, the sidewalk there. But even if with that light, it's uh, the the shade. It's that light is not getting to the to the sidewalk because you have this corridor of box trucks just blocking the light. And we hope that this design can kind of open up that area, adding more pedestrian space, also uh, allowing that light to, to make it less uh, of a forbidding kind of uh, um, area for people walking. Um, you know, and you and that also you can see that that um, that that sidewalk is just barely passable for somebody in, uh, you know, a wheelchair or pushing a stroller or, and so the design tries to address those types of limitations that the existing condition has. Another issue that we see is uh, the lack of north-south bicycle connections. While so there are some uh, plans um, in the works, as I mentioned, uh, this eastern part of Greenpoint really could use some more uh, connectivity for um, these uh, just different options for people uh, riding. It's coming in context of a street that is kind of in the middle. Um, oh, this says Queens, that's terrible, I'm sorry. Uh, coming in the middle of um, uh, Brooklyn uh, corridors, uh, but, but at the same time, I think what you see is while, while vehicles on Kingsland are moving, I mean, it's only a block long, so you're not seeing a lot of speeding or anything, but you're seeing really heavy vehicles that really need to be spaced, uh, at a greater distance from people that don't have that kind of protection, those vulnerable street users, like people walking, people on bikes and if there were if there were uh, interactions or conflicts or crashes between those uh, different modes, I mean, they'll they're very likely to be very severe injuries, and so we want to minimize that uh, to the greatest extent possible. And we have uh, a, a good record, our, our toolkit for this type of uh, safety project of the protected bike lanes really has improved uh, the safety of uh, streets throughout the city. We see 15% drop, uh, drops in crashes and with injuries, and we see an even greater drop, 21%, in pedestrian injuries. Uh, this comes in context of the Green Wave Plan, where um, in the wake of a lot of uh, uh, fatal crashes of people on bikes and pedestrians, uh, the city really committed to, um, to identifying pr the problems and then uh, which, and the solution, which would be more protected bicycle lanes. And so committing the city to building 30 miles of protected bicycle lanes each year. And while this, you know, is admittedly a short segment, uh, it goes towards that, uh, towards that goal. And so these goals that I'm talking about are improving the pedestrian experience between Greenpoint Avenue and uh, Newtown Creek Walk, 
uh, both by expanding the pedestrian space and by shortening pedestrian crossing distances, uh, developing the north-south bike connections, uh, configuring Kingsland Avenue parking to optimize for pass passenger vehicles and, and sort of making it more difficult uh, with for those illegal uh, trucks to be stored there. Uh, you know, I mean, it's NYPD can't be everywhere uh, every day. Uh, so enforcement is kind of a, uh, it's, it's harder than actually redesigning the street in some ways. And, but at the same time, we want to maintain the motor vehicle circulation. We know that these are important businesses. They need to be, uh, they need to continue their operations. So what you're seeing here is a section on the, the widest part of Kingsland Avenue. Um, it's 82 feet wide. Currently it's separated by this Jersey barrier. Uh, there is two way, I mean, there's no markings on the street, so it, it's kind of uh, lawless, but the way it seems to operate typically is two way traffic on this north side and uh, eastbound traffic on that south side. Uh, what we're proposing is to remove that barrier and uh, create an expanded pedestrian space on the south sidewalk. Um, this is uh, what we're proposing is uh, painted uh, uh, flush pedestrian space, but in the future, this is something that could be built in concrete. Um, and next to that would be a uh, two-way bicycle lane with a buffer in between a uh, angled parking there's a travel lane next to the angle parking. Um, you, you can see that it seems very wide, but uh, it's a typical situation that you need a wider travel lane to next to angle parking so that vehicles can get out of that parking space. And then on the north sidewalk, um, or on the north side of the, the street, uh, we have a wide parking lane and a wide travel lane. Uh, we heard uh, from the community that there is the need for um, uh, vehicles to queue up as they uh, wait to access the different uh, operations on this north side of the street. And I think that uh, we're providing uh, extra space so that that can happen. On top is kind of what you see currently, and on bottom is a similar example where you have this angle parking uh, creating the protection for the two-way bike lane. Uh, in addition to what you see in that section with the pedestrian space, the bike lane, the parking, the traffic, and another lane of parking, we're also proposing to shorten these crossing distances by uh, putting islands, uh, adding crosswalks, uh, curb extensions, Currently, um, you'll see that uh, people uh, that people actually park all the way there. You know, without the crosswalk, uh, it becomes you know difficult for people to make that crossing because you know just people park wherever they can. And you know, part of that reason is that there's not enough parking, and uh, we can we're hopefully uh, addressing that issue. Now on the part just north of Greenpoint Avenue, it's a little narrower. Uh, we're proposing, uh, so currently there's parking on each side of the street, one lane of traffic in each way. Uh, what we're proposing is to remove the lane of uh, parking on that west uh, curb, but um, that's offset by the gains in parking that we get in on the other part. So instead of using parking as the protection on this bike lane, what we're using is a Jersey barrier. And so trying to maintain this protected parking, but at the same time, um, so if, because this is a narrow street, we don't have the ability to use uh, the parked vehicles to do that. So on top is what you see currently, and on the bottom, it's sort of an example of uh, what we're proposing. And a plan of that, uh, on the right, you see Greenpoint Avenue. This is sort of tilted uh, um, to the side. The north is over here. Uh, you have the 
protected lane with Jersey barriers, two lanes of traffic, parking on that east curve. And uh, also uh, on the other side of Greenpoint Avenue to Meeker Street, uh, we have a more standard uh, bike lane that we're proposing. Uh, we're not proposing uh, a protected lane on that side. It's a narrower street. Uh, so basically what you're seeing here, it's just uh, taking that extra width uh, and putting a bike lane there, giving a dedicated space to people riding bikes, but at the same time, not affecting uh, the travel lane, not affecting the parking. So on top is what you see currently and on the bottom is what we're proposing. Uh, one sort of uh, oddity of Kingsland is where it really widens out at Meeker. Uh, what we are proposing is to create a little pedestrian space to shorten that crossing distance. At the same time, we need to accommodate turning vehicles coming from, from Meeker Avenue, but we're really shortening that crossing distance by, I'm not exactly sure what the numbers are, but I'm guessing, you know, close to 15, maybe 20 feet. And so really sort of improving that pedestrian experience where currently they're really exposed to, uh, to the traffic. And so just to summarize, um, uh, protected bike lanes uh, are uh, in our toolkit of uh, kind of providing safety for all street users. Uh, we hope to create more uh, bike connections, increase pedestrian safety, uh, especially as we're uh, walking to the Newtown Creek Nature Walk. And uh, part of this comes in the context of uh, preventing illegal truck parking, um, and all while trying to maintain the existing traffic capacity. So I would love to hear any questions and uh, try to answer them. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Preston. Um, I'm going to turn this discussion over to Karen and Willis. Um, Karen, would you like to go first with any questions or comments? Sure. Just on Kingsland, we're, we're still, you know, proposing the parking. I would just ask, you know, you're, you're saying that the lane is wide enough for parking for queuing and for a travel lane. Um, I don't know how everyone else feels about that, but um, I would just say that we would need to monitor that because I would just be afraid of if there is queuing occurring and there's not enough space, that then they would be going in the opposite direction, um, you know, head on with, with trucks that are coming down. Right. Um, and just to just to be clear, we're not proposing to change any parking regulations on on that north curb. So currently, there are some places uh, where there's not parking, and that can you know uh, that can operate as queuing area as well. So uh, just Correct. to be clear but, there, right? But that starts mid block, so right. um, it starts and, where the fire hydrant is, and then it goes to no standing, and then it goes to truck loading and un unloading by by a loco. Um, so I'm I'm really talking about you know that last piece um, where you're allowing parking. I would just ask, like I said, that we monitor it, and if we need to remove parking, to remove parking for queuing. Um, then the other section, so I, I just want to be clear on, on Kingsland, I guess the north, you know, north of Greenpoint Avenue. So you're proposing to remove the parking that's across the street from the storage and put a Jersey barrier for, for the protected bike lane. Uh, yes. Okay. So um, I just want to make sure, can you go over currently what the parking counts are now, um, well, and omit obviously the illegal, I guess the illegal parking, but um, if you could go over the, how, how, what is the gain? How many parking spaces? Um, because obviously the parking across the street from the storage 
um, would be important for them. But if we're definitely making it up with the angled parking, then I, I feel um, comfortable with that. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a little bit hard to say because, you know, obviously the, the, um, the amount of illegal truck storage is sort of variable, uh, you know, it could, um, but when, when I've been out there, I have counted about 40 spaces uh, available for parking uh, passenger cars um, on this space, like on both sides of the, um, the Jersey barrier and also on this curb. Uh, and we're proposing about 60 spaces while on this curb, uh, you're losing about, I think it's 14, 12 to 14 spaces. So um, it, typically, I think you're going to be seeing a gain. I mean, like I say, some of that's kind of, you know, can vary day by day, depending on how many illegal truck trucks are parked out there. But we feel that this new parking arrangement is going to keep uh, those illegal trucks from parking there and so that that will be um, space made available for passenger vehicles, for people who work here, people who are visiting the, the nature walk. Aaron? Yeah, that that was the main things. Thank you. Aaron, anything else? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, thanks, Karen. Uh, Willis, go. Uh, thanks, Eric. Thank you, Preston, uh, for the presentation. I think that we talked about this a little bit last week, but you know, my concern is um, is the the sort of <laughs> spaces that are at the at the end of the parking field um, and how Currently, people just park wherever, and I get that there's some lack of clarity, uh, and this will help. But I also feel like, due to the lack, the lax enforcement around anything in this area, people also take advantage of that. And so, you know, I think starting with the where the sort of crossing is from one side of Kingsland to the other, um, having something in place there, whether it's planters, our organization, Newtown Creek Alliance would be, you know, willing to, to talk about entering into a maintenance agreement for maintaining planters or whether it's boulders or something else, because otherwise people are just going to be parking on that yellow space. And so any way we can deal with that would be great. And then the other thing is that on the, to the left of this image, where the connection is to the nature walk, that is also often people park there. And again, because it's very unclear what's allowed and what's not, and there's no enforcement. And so the issue is that if people come out or walking out of the nature walk, and I see this like literally every day from our office, people walk out of the nature walk. And then if it's a wall of cars, you will just avoid it and go over to the, to the north side of the street. And which is the area we want pedestrians to avoid because there's more truck traffic there serving Alaco and Broadway stages. So I would just, I guess on that second point, I think like having DOT needs to really coordinate with DEP because that is a, an egress that they're no longer using, but that's their facility. And we need to have some clarity about like where the parking field ends and what the regulations are so that people aren't just blocking parking at the start of the bike lane. And then same for the pedestrian island. So those are like two specific thoughts about this area to make sure this actually functions. Uh, no, those are great points. Um, I We will uh, be uh, having our engineers kind of like come to the site and look at those. So these three spaces uh, could potentially be built up in concrete. I mean, I can't until until those engineers kind of like visit it, I can't make any promises at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think if if it's not possible for them to be built in concrete, I think the your proposal of uh, having a maintenance agreement, kind of building up some uh, 
you know, having planters or whatever, that that's a great idea. We also have a, a toolkit of uh, different types of uh, what we call flexible delineators, the flex posts, um, which, uh, you know, I mean, if they are successful in, in many locations, uh, I understand like in an area that has a history of sort of difficult enforcement, you know, I can understand your concerns, but, but we can try to work together on that. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, I, I feel like obliged to say that we, we all know the flex posts do not work. Greenpoint Avenue bridge had whatever hundreds of them installed very soon after they're all completely gone. Also, I had a friend of mine who was killed on a protected bike path because a car ran over a plastic flex post. And there's in fact now a book that's out that talks about this ent entire incidence and why it took so long for the city to actually install real protection for that bike path. So I just feel like an obligation to say that as a, it's a non-starter that the flex post is not gonna do anything to protect anybody. So just throwing that out there. Um, the other question I had was about the um, pedestrian, the extended pedestrian space. And I think we're all very eager to see these improvements happen, but what's the process for, for creating that pedestrian space, not just as paint on the sidewalk, but as an actual extension of the sidewalk with street trees and other street features that would uh, help improve this experience? Yeah, I think we're, that's probably more in the kind of the realm of capital projects. Yeah. Um, it would be sort of uh, kind of beyond the, the capacity of what our, um, the crew that kind of does these kind of small islands that uh, go along with our projects, uh, what they could do uh, this year. So um, I, I think that's what you're talking about is kind of a capital project. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, is Gina Urgento on the call? I thought I saw Gina logged in. Gina Urgento, yes, no? Or anybody from uh, Broadway Stages? Anyone from Metro Fuel? Anyone from Malaco? Okay. Uh, any other committee members have comments or questions? City storage, I think, is on. The, on. Um, oh, are they? Yes. Hi, this is Tanya. I'm sorry that I in and out. Tanya. I am driving in this terrible weather. <laughs> yes, I hear it outside. <laughs> sorry. Okay. So I got connected Tanya, like in and out. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Tanya, do you have any uh, comments or questions? Um, no, overall, we're we're on board. We like uh, a lot of the changes, especially to get some of the traffic control going a little bit better. Um, we're not sure 100% about the um, like the no standing and like how that affects like our clients directly because you know being self storage, we want to make sure that the customers can easily unload and unload like as fast as possible. Um, you know, we don't want them obviously in the middle of the street or trying to cross the street with their boxes or crates. And while we do have an indoor um, loading area to some capacity, we're going into our peak season um, right now where we're entering it. So that's the only concern that I'm not sure if I would want to do entirely no parking on the um, Kingsland Avenue side that's adjacent to our building. Is, is this where you mean? Um... So just, I am driving, so I can't look. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> just north of just north of Greenpoint yeah. Avenue. Yeah, north of Sorry, Greenpoint Avenue. They're they're so, um, yeah, they're on uh Greenpoint on the corner of Greenpoint and Kingsland. So I mean, it we can also we can also talk about different types of parking regulations that uh, yeah that that could keep uh you know the vehicles turning over there. Uh, to make sure that there is uh, kind of available curb space for people. Yeah. You know, um, and that that could possibly be a, a solution to, your, to that concern. 
Yeah, so that's that's our main concern. I mean, we like the additional parking because we also have staff that drive in, they take public transportation, they drive in. So we like all the additional spaces and for the staff and stuff, that's fine. But to get the customers to turn over like faster in and out, we need, we would need some kind of parking, even if it's muni meter or time parking, whatever it is. Okay. Uh, I can bring that to the appropriate uh, unit at DOT to, to evaluate. Thank you. Anything else, Tanya? You're good? All good. Okay. Um, so, Preston, we'll do follow-up on uh, possible... Uh, what would you call it? It's not really a loading zone, right? It's... Um... Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it's shorthand. We could call it a loading zone, but just maybe but it, uh, like loading zone implies commercial. So it would have to right. be loading zone. There is no. Yeah, short kind public. of short term parking parking yeah. or. Um, um, okay, yeah, well, we, you know what? I'll leave that. I'll leave that open. We'll take it for the record. And if you can get a, a reply within the next week or two um, and just submit that through Rhonda or whatever to the to the board office. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. Any other stakeholders on the call operating in this area? Okay. Committee, any questions or comments? Hi, this is Kevin. Um, I just had a question about the angled parking. Is there any way or any plan to put in uh, concrete like stops? Um, yeah, yeah, it was. That's the that's the typical. Oh, perfect, uh, perfect. Yeah, good, good, awesome. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you kind of want to ensure that the vehicles don't overhang so much that, uh, I mean, you know, in the worst case scenario that they actually block the bike lane, but even uh, in a more moderate scenario that they sort of prevent um, maintenance vehicles from either clearing the snow or sweeping the street. So yeah, that's the, the car stops are a, a tool towards that goal. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Board members? Uh, Committee members? Uh, hey, Eric. Yeah, Will, let's go. Well, I was just wondering if, um, to talk more about, I mean, I don't, know. I don't want to get too distracted from this north of Kingsland, which is how we sort of raise this, but to talk about the other bike paths and to sort of understand like DOT's, like the rationale for putting, I appreciate the, the language about the value of protected bike lanes and the city's goal to install more and how they create safer streets for everybody. But, you know, was there an analysis of putting a protected bike path on Kingsland or Monitor south of Greenpoint Avenue? Um, you know, I'm thinking specifically of, I mean, Kingsland is a very uh, wide street, as, as we all know. And so, you know, was there a look at ways to, to make it a safer experience? Uh, and not to get too off topic, but you, because you did have a photo of it in the presentation at the very beginning, maybe you can go back and look at this real quick. Uh, of Greenpoint Avenue, and there's a person on a scooter and a, a semi truck next to them. And there's stretch right there on the top. There's stretches of Greenpoint Avenue where there is space exactly right here, where there's space for a divider, a Jersey barrier. And this would obviously protect people like this guy and myself. I used to ride the same route down Greenpoint Avenue for like seven years straight until I moved to a different part of the neighborhood. So, you know, this, this is like would help significantly for uh, safety and also would contribute to the city's goals of, of implementing more separated bike paths. So two questions like Greenpoint Avenue, why not have Jersey barriers and sections where it's viable, um, including up onto the bridge? And then also was there analysis of specifically Kingsland, but also monitor and, and having protected bike lanes. Right. Well, as you note, um, the 
the commissioner and the mayor uh, have committed to protecting uh, many uh, bike lanes. Uh, that is an ongoing process. It is it is somewhat a uh, time consuming process as you know we acquire and install each uh, barrier. We'll be piloting a lot of new uh, types, um, kind of like low profile uh, concrete and rubber barriers uh, this summer. Uh, so which that could speed up the process. Uh, so, I mean, I can't, uh, I can't commit to this, uh, tonight, but it is something that is ongoing and, uh, you know, it's definitely an, on our radar. Um, as far as the protected bike lane, um, south of, uh, of Greenpoint Avenue, um, I mean, I think the, while that, uh, Kingsland is a little bit wider. Monitor really isn't wide enough, um, uh, but also Kingsland uh, is is also a truck route north of Nassau, which um, you know ca causes you know extra complications as far as making sure that there's enough width for the trucks. Um, so I mean, in the end, uh, we. Um, we are just doing the protected lane north of uh, of Greenpoint Avenue. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Preston, is there any way that we could, even though it is a truck route, is there any way that we could look at a protected bike lane there? Um. I mean, I mean, not not in this not in this round, obviously. But, yeah, yeah. But you know, for the next for next season. Um. Yeah. I mean, we can. Uh, uh, if I mean, if the the community boards requesting it, we can uh, take a look at it. Okay. All right. Maybe we'll put that on a future agenda. Um. Okay. Any other committee? Public, I can't see raised hands. Um, so, um, Kevin Lachera. Kevin Lachera. Actually, yeah. yeah, keep the presentation up. Kevin, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I guess just a couple of thoughts on this. Um, you know, one thing that, uh, Obviously, this would be a tremendous improvement to what exists there now, which is nothing. Um, you know, and uh, so that's that's great. Um, you know, something that I I do think this is a bit of a a missed opportunity up um, along the treatment plant to create you know more pedestrian space and more cycling space. Um, you know, I, that entire half of the street could be closed, um, on Kingsland to be a plaza that links the Newtown Creek nature walk to gateway to Greenpoint. Um, you know, you have travel lanes in and out. I understand there's concerns about queuing, but, um, you know, the angled parking that exists there now, I mean, it sounds like you're increasing the parking by, by about 20 spots. Um, from well, a, less than that because it's accommodating. You know, we're also taking away spaces on the around the corner. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, I just think that you know, if we're building the infrastructure for folks to get to these spaces safely by walking and biking, um, you know, we should lean in. So you know, I mean, I just think that at the very least, the parking. Um, yeah, you know, I know. I heard Willis's concern. I think it's a good one about the corners here and how close the parking comes up to the corners of this. Um, I think you've got to build it out in concrete. And I think that if you were to take two or three or four parking spaces from the edge here and build it out so those sight lines are just as clear as can be and that yeah, parking is just as delineated as can be, I think that would uh, would be a great improvement. Um, you know, I, I also, um, you know, is the, the angled parking, I'm just thinking about, I understand there's not the capital money right now for the build out of the pedestrian space. Um, you know, I think that's something that a lot of people would be eager to see, you know, trees and planters and, you know, in this space. Um, I guess what I'm wondering is before this goes in the ground here, 
um, is the the angled parking with the travel lane there on Kingsland, is that the basically maximum amount of space that that can take up there? Does that make sense? Like, can it's, the angled parking come out any further than it does now? Or is or is that the, um, you know, is that kind of, have you pushed the limit? Um, it's the minimum amount of space. Um, current, it, we require about 18 foot stalls and uh, a, I think 20, well, if, um, if it was like 60 degree angle parking, I, I think that that could possibly change. Um, it might, I think it would reduce the amount of parking spaces. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the standards are off the top of my head for, um, you know, if it wasn't 90 degree angle parking, uh, I think, I think maybe you could shrink that distance a little bit. Um, but, uh, also probably lose some parking spaces. I just think it's something that if we're, if we're putting this in the ground and we're talking or thinking about more capital money as time goes on, it would be good to know what that breakdown would be. I mean, obviously you don't have it in front of you, but just to know, Hey, it's the difference of four parking spaces, but it's the difference of an additional, you know, couple feet of pedestrian space that we'll be pushing for or talking about. Um, to be this, you know, kind of connective tissue between these two major um, open space projects in the neighborhood. Um, if that would be possible to get back to the committee uh, to get that information, just if it's 60 degrees versus 90 degrees, is it, you know, is it eight foot of pedestrian space versus 10 foot of pedestrian space? Um, if that is something that could easily be provided, I think that would be very helpful. Yeah, um, I mean, also, you know, we heard early concerns earlier about ensuring that there's uh, adequate space on that north curb as well. So, I mean, I mean, it's trying to balance the those kind of two issues as well. Um, I mean, I, you know, I would love to add more pedestrian space. Um, I would also love to add more, uh, you know, space to ensure that the queuing doesn't uh, inter interrupt Kind of the safe flow of traffic um but no i hear your point uh we can definitely take a look to see you know kind of what we're talking about if we do yeah, just what the difference is diff sure. what the difference is so that we sure. know sure. you know i think that would be helpful and i think looking at those corners would is really important both on the you know kind of east and west side there you know you build that out on the side a, a space or two in and you make it so that it's not the same blind spots and i think you got to armor it up Otherwise, exactly what Willis says, those delineators are not going to, classic delineators are not going to do the trick over there. Um, let me just, I have one more thing. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> is there any work happening to the sidewalk in front of the gateway site? That's on the, that's on Kingsland between, like, uh, it's, it's, it's Kingsland in, um, between Greenpoint. It's like Kingsland between Greenpoint and Kingsland. Um, like, like this sidewalk right here? Or? Yes, that sidewalk. Is there any, because right now, I mean, obviously the park, you know, the bike lane, you're adding a bike lane, but no pedestrian path there. Right? Yeah, there really wasn't uh, enough a very, space. Very difficult, that is a very, very, very difficult sidewalk. Yeah, I understand. I mean, I I would have loved to add it, um, I'm another five feet of pedestrian space, but there just really isn't the the width to uh, to to do that as well as maintain all of these other um, sort of operations or okay um, yeah I think one of my primary things is just is you know if we are going to be talking about future capital money for this space to try to get as much pedestrian space set down as we can um, and to know what our options are um, I'm also concerned you know what Willis was talking about. Um, you know, I, 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 I think that you've really got to have protected lanes on Kingsland. I understand the limitations on monitor, um, you know, but I think especially because it's a truck route, you know, you're building, you're building sharrows on a truck route. Well, they're not sharrows. Well, you know, I mean, it's, it's totally unprotected, you know, and it, it is an, it is an uninterrupted Kingsland at, at some of the stretches is so in, uninterrupted and there is so much speeding along that way 
you know, that, um, you know, I, I think it's going to cause a major, I think, I, you know, I, I think it's a problem. You know, I, I think the connectivity between Meeker is great. And I think the connectivity between this space is great. You're protecting the lanes under Meeker. You know, you're protecting the lanes here. You know, you're talking about protecting the lanes on McGinnis Boulevard. Um, but, you know, we're not going to protect folks as they're coming down Kingsland as these trucks are speeding towards the bridge. You know, I, I think it's a huge problem. You know, I, I don't know how, I, I don't, I, I don't think it's going to work um, in a way that is going to keep people safe. You know, and I think that on Kingsland, you certainly have the space to lean into it. Uh, monitor, I get it, you know, but Kingsland, I, I, I don't know what the, what the reasoning there would be not to do it, especially because you guys are looking for spaces to put Jersey barricades. Is there a, Thank you. Yeah, I, I, Thanks, is, is there an answer to that or, or, or is there- I mean, answer? yeah. Uh, I mean, we, like, like I said before, we can, uh, we can look at that if that's something that the community board is asking for. Um, uh, I mean, I think there, there may be some trade-offs that we'd want to be able to report to the community board. What would be the trade-offs do you think? Um, I mean, I, I'm, I haven't, I'm not in a position to say right now, but I mean, obviously there's parking, obviously there's going to be uh, a narrower, um, a narrower way, uh, a narrower space for trucks on a truck route. Um, and, uh, I think those are the primary, um, issues that I can, can see right now, but what's the current width of okay, Kevin, we got to move on. Well, Eric, um, I just, if they're going to build this lane and they're not going to protect it, like, I, you know, I think it's a problem. I think, you know, they're, they're presenting this plan and I think that there's elements of the plan that look really good on the Newtown Creek side of things, but you know, if they're going to connect. You know they're, they're connecting two they're, they're connecting two protected lanes with an unprotected lane through a truck route you know kingsland's really wide there do we know the width of kingsland there i think it's about 35 feet in total it's 35 feet um i don't have it at my fingertips right now but i think it's yeah i think it's 35 feet I'm sorry, which part of Kingsland are we talking about? <clears throat> South of Greenpoint Avenue. I think it's wider than 35 feet. Oh. Okay, so by city storage or? No, across. So between between the Broadway stages, oh, between yeah. the old Exxon land and the, and the truck lot. Okay, so you're talking about between Norman and Greenpoint Avenue? Yeah. So you want Wagner from DOT. I just measured it. It's, I can confirm it's 35 feet. 35. Okay. All right. So you're talking about where Broadway stages is and sorry, Exxon Mobil between Norman Avenue and Greenpoint Avenue on Kingsland. That's where you're talking about, Kevin? That that is the stretch that I am most concerned about because I think that, you know, it's it, as you go further, as you go, you know, south of Norman, it's it's residential or semi-residential, right? At least on one side of the street. And then when you go, you know, then Kings on the rest of it down by McGolrick, it's residential, residential. But in this stretch, when you have the cars turn off Norman up there, that's the truck lane. Cars come down, trucks come down that area, Kingsland, like, you know, like crazy. And I, I just think that if you're putting a bike lane there, you've got to protect it. You know, you've got so, to yeah. I would, unfortunately, you know, Kevin, right now, I feel that Broadway Stages is not, or unless Gina is on the call, I think, you know, unfortunately, I understand that DOT is showing us, you know, the additional networks and connectors, but I think, you know, we, we need to secure and lock down you know, um, this project and this uh, redesign of, of Kingsland by the Newtown Creek plant. And and I I totally understand, I get you where, where we're going with this, um, but I'm, I need to know, like, are we, 
are we supporting this project along with the additional bike lanes that are, that are you're showing in this project? Or it's informational? Are, are you asking DOT? Yes, I'm asking DOT, sorry. Yeah, we're, uh, we are proposing the, uh, everything that I've shown you um, from Meeker North. I mean, what about these gates that you guys have put over in Times Square, like the, the fences, the silver fences? It doesn't got to be Jersey barricades that are three feet wide. You can put the fences up like you have elsewhere. I just think that this is, you know, I, I'm sorry, but I, I just think that like this is going to, this is a, a you know, a, a, it's not going to be pretty. Kevin, we can take a greater look at it, but. It's not as simple as just dropping Jersey barriers down in the middle of the street and protecting the lane. There's a lot of things that we have to look at. That's why you don't frequently see 35 feet streets that have protected bike lanes on them. It's not as easy as, as you think, think it might be. Well, I, I'm There's aware a lot of driveways true. here. There's, we need to get FDNY clearance. We need to make sure sanitation can access the space. Um, so it's, it's, it's very complicated, but we can take a look at it um, and report back. Okay, uh, we have to move on. So, um, Karen, do you, uh, or Willis, do um, we wanna make a motion with uh, recommendations at all? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I hear what Kevin's saying, and I think that like we a recommendation would be that we approve the plan, and that DOT we need DOT to come back to get into a further further discussion specifically about the bike lane on on Kingsland Avenue because I agree because I that's now my current <laughs> commute down that long block, so I ride every single day, and it is. The street is wide. The sidewalks are incredibly wide. Broadway stages has a lot of activity, but it's only on one side of the street. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of room for improvement. So I, you know, I would personally would suggest we approve the plan with the condition that we, the DOT comes back to have further discussion about a protected bike lane. The I would say this protected bike lanes that because we talked about this as well, that connect to this network, Greenpoint Avenue and Kingsland Avenue. I don't know. Yeah, it's like too much to ask, but. <laughs> I mean, I was just sort of penciling out some numbers and like, I think you have like two options where you lose all the parking on one side of the street if you're talking about a barrier protected line, lane, which doesn't seem to work for the different types of operations you have there. Or I think you have a parking protected lane that is really too narrow for, I mean, you're talking about an 11 foot lane. I, I think you're, it, it's, it's, it's a much narrower street than we typically put a uh, parking protected lane on. And, and considering the, the different types of businesses that are on that stretch, I, I think there would be some, some issues. Are there, can I, sorry, Go ahead. I mean, are there, cause this is also, this is an issue in many other areas around in the IBZ as well, where you have like incredibly wide sidewalks that are not heavily trafficked and you know, I'll just say personally, as someone who walks and rides my bicycle and drives to the area, if I'm on my bicycle and there's a 10 foot sidewalk and no one's on it, I'm going to go on the sidewalk, even if it's illegal, because it's way safer and the danger, you know, so I'm just like, I don't know, sorry to rant. I guess the question is like, is DOT looking at ways to also like better treat the entire street streetscape? 
the sidewalk, these very large sidewalks, you know, and large streets to be more, I don't know, protective of all users. Is there like, basically you could extend the sidewalk by like three, three, four feet and have a bike lane there. And then like, I don't, it just seems like there's, there's gotta be something to do here. Cause there's a lot of space. Right. Um, I mean, that's the type of project that would happen in a in a capital project uh, yeah. where you're where you're reconstructing the sidewalk and the curb. And uh, um, I mean, it's it's potentially a valid solution, but, uh, you know, it's I can't tell. I can't say right at this point. Um, OK, so we're going to have to table that for now. Any. Karen, any any other recommendations, or do you want to make a motion, or Willis, do you want to make a motion? Um, Karen. Yeah, Willis, did didn't you make a motion, or no? You. Yeah, no. I mean, I would make a motion to accept okay. the plan as approved. You know, with I mean, maybe it's not conditions, but you know, also asking DOT to come back to discuss well, this is me area john before you make your motion i'd like to make a comment okay. i think that um because gina argento is not on this um zoom tonight i think she should be apprised of the plan before and and participate before we we support this plan so real quick there was a call Anybody last else week who is a stakeholder Okay, yeah, real quick. Everybody who was a stakeholder on this section was was engaged. Tony, Gina, Monica from Broadway Stages were all on the call last week. Uh, Tanya and Avi from Self Storage, people from United Metro Fuel, and Mike Alaco from Alaco Storage. So they all saw the plan and, you know, weighed in on it just as background. Okay, that's fine. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Okay, then I'm fine. Okay. Okay, cool. but... But I just do want to add that they did support the bike lane, but now we're asking for something different. Well, yeah, I think I'm just I, saying. So I just want to, and that's why I mentioned it before, that when we're talking about Jersey barriers or physically protected or removing, that that wasn't what was discussed prior. So Mary is correct that any anything additional Broadway stages and the businesses along that stretch should be involved. Um, we haven't with, changed with the plan discussion. since that meeting. Yeah, I'm just, Karen, I'm just saying that like DOT needs to commit to coming back and having further discussion about how to increase protected, protected bike connections to this protected bike lane that, that we're in support of. Right. I'm, I mean, I agree even on Greenpoint Avenue, but um, I'm, I'm just saying that, yes. Um, and also, I, I guess, can we maybe first discuss additional recommendations if the committee has re additional recommendations to add to, um, to the vote? Because I would add monitor, you know, the parking mm -hmm. on, what is it, the north side of Kingsland, um, if needed remove additional parking for queuing. Um, and then I would also recommend that this gets placed for a capital improvement project to make this permanent. The extension of the sidewalks, um, as well as you mentioned adding the trees, things of, like that, I think we should state now. So Karen, go ahead. Make just make that so. Um, just restate that so I, I can have it clearly for as a recommendation. So my I, what my my notes say: monitor, remove additional parking to allow for queuing for a locko. But you can you right on that, that a little? I believe it. Yeah. Um, monitor um, park. Monitor queuing and safety obstruction on Kingsland on the north side and if needed move additional um, remove additional parking for queuing got it the second thing is um, to request that DOT 
places this design for capital um, project for future capital project to make make it uh, permanent. The sidewalk extension. Okay, so I'm just going to restate it. Request DOT places this design for a future capital project to make the sidewalk extensions permanent. Yes? Hello? Hey. Yeah, oh, sounds good. Didn't we also say exploring the angled parking? I feel like that was one of the for more pedestrian space or my. Yes, you're, you're correct. Ryan, Kevin, um, recommended. To look at and Willis recommended to look at the corners. Yeah, armoring the armoring the pedestrian spaces and angled parking. Yeah. If okay. that's, if that's. Uh, okay, can that sorry, I'm dying over here. Can, can, can you restate that? Um, uh, make that a clear statement, Ryan. Um, or Karen, whoever. Or I feel like it's, yeah. So, like, it, and explore um, further pedestrian safety measures like angled parking, armoring the corners, et cetera, and everything else in their toolkit. Well, Toolkit implies what they can do without. Oh a yeah, yeah. Project. Sorry, sorry. I didn't mean. I was trying to be fancy with the word that you used, but you're right. It implies a lot more. So scratch that. Okay. So explore further pedestrian safety measures, such as angled. Well. No, uh, because what Kevin was asking for was to remove additional angled parking spaces and adding additional pedestrian space, Willis was asking for securing the, the corners so that vehicles don't go in mm -hmm. into the bike lane and park mm -hmm. and have it more safer, I guess, for the pedestrians and cyclists. And Willis, you could correct me if I'm wrong. So what? That's it. Okay. All right. Ugh. I need that stated clearly, though. Um, I mean, I get it. So I'm, I'm just trying to. No, but we had it before. We said it before. Um, Sorry. Ryan, you, you it, used armored. What, what did you use uh, before? Yeah. The word? Armor, armoring the pedestrian spaces. Yes, something at, like that. At the corners. At the corners, yes. Forming the pedestrian spaces at the corner of, it's got to be specific, Kings Lane and Greenpoint. Was there another section, Willis? By the Newtown Creek. Um, the east, east and west corners was the terms they were using. I'm trying to remember, like, so it, is, it matches, like, their their project. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, you could say the the entrance to the nature walk. Yeah. And the corner of Kingsland and Kingsland. Okay. Kingsland and Kingsland. Okay, armoring the pedestrian spaces at the corner of Kingsland and Kingsland as well as the entrance to the nature walk. Good. Oh, yes, no. Yeah. Okay. Any other recommendations? Can, can we, I, I like the idea of, of, of putting in there somewhere that they continue to come back to improve it. I know we sort of just said that, but like the, the, we've really just started the basic protections and we're, cre I feel like we have an opportunity here to have industrial space and bike and pedestrian safety. If we design it right and continue the conversations, because it really just takes like the truck slowing down, 
the bikers knowing sight lines, like everyone paying attention and like real infrastructure change. And I feel like here is a good place, but the, the conversation has to be continual and growing. And I like, I feel like if, if we could ask DOT to, to keep coming back to this somehow, to keep exploring how this mesh of industry and pedestrian space works. I don't know if it's semi-annual, something like that, but I feel like like us ask, like asking for that. Sorry, I'm discombobulated, but you get what I'm saying? All right, All right. well, okay, so that's, that's in there already. Um, I mean, I feel like if we approve the plan and, and yeah, specifically, uh, you know, above north of Greenpoint Avenue, and then we can, you know, it'll go in, and then we can see how it's working, and then have DOT back um, maybe in the fall or or before the end of the year, early next year, to to discuss how it's working, and then go from there. Yes? That was good. Okay, good. All right, so um, if, the, if there are no other recommendations, I'm just going to read this back. So a motion made by Willis, approve the plan as presented with the following recommendations. That DOT return for discussion on protected bike lanes on Kingsland. I'm sorry, protected bike, bike lanes on Kingsland from Meeker to Greenpoint Avenue and other... Um, Well, you could you could just take the you know connecting roads. I mean, the other one is Greenpoint Avenue. Okay, so let's just say DOT returns for a discussion on protected lanes. What did you just say, Willis? On the connecting, you know, connecting on roadways or whatever. Connecting network. Connecting network. bike network. Thank you. Bike network. Okay. Um, monitor queuing and safety. Mo on Monitor Street, queuing and safety obstructions on north side, and if needed, remove additional parking to allow for queuing for Alaco. Request DOT places this design for a future capital project to make the sidewalk extensions permanent. And armoring the pedestrian spaces at the corner of Kingsland and Kingsland, as well as the entrance to the nature walk. Any other recommendations? Is there a second? Second, Karen. Thank you. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstentions? Motion carries. OK. Um, So, sorry, one second. Okay. Uh, all right. So, Preston, Craig, thank you. Um, thank you for this. Um, well, uh, I'll be in touch with Rhonda for follow up on the on the items that we um, that were brought up during this discussion. Um, and uh, Eric. We'll, yes. Yeah. Before you be. Before you just say goodbye to Preston, I think Craig had to go because he has a newborn at home. But okay. um, uh, so my understanding is that we're going to be asked to make this presentation again at the next full board meeting. I just haven't officially heard from the executive committee the ruling on that yet, right? But that's that's, that's right. what I, I, right, I so. believe the executive committee is next week. Jerry, is that right? That's correct. Okay. So yes, Rhonda, in answer to your question, we we would like to have this presented to the full board. Um, out of, out of order. Usually, it goes to the board first and then to the committee. But we're doing this in reverse just because we would like to see this done this summer. Right. So the hope is that your recommendation, then the full board will vote on it, and hope. Hopefully, go along with your recommendation. Oh, right? Correct, and then you know, since Rhonda, I'm sure you're writing all these recommendations down, and uh, Preston is taking no taking notes as well because he's already mentioned stuff that's been open in the discussion that uh, it could be 
tweaked if necessary to um, to incorporate some of these recommendations by the by the May meeting. Well, I think that you are going to need to follow up because everything is that said. I mean, in your motion, yes, but everything that said isn't automatically. Right. You know no, I, under I, mean? I understand. Okay. I'll, I'll be in, I'll be in touch with with you and Preston about follow up on those those couple of questions. Great. That's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you and so much, Preston, for joining me here. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank thank you very much. Um, all oh, right. Oh, I'm sorry. Bye, Karen. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Preston, you, you can go. I'll be staying though for other uh, DOT issues. Thank you so much. Okay. Sure. Good night. Okay. Great. Uh, and Dan, thanks for getting that that measurement on uh, on Kingsland on the fly. Um, okay. Uh, we will do item number one: uh, review of pedestrian safety improvements. The intersections of Broadway, Flushing, and Graham Avenues. Um, I think it's uh, Lauren Martin and Dan Wagner. Um, yeah. Rhonda, yeah. if you want to start or go. Um, hi. So Lauren is unavailable tonight. She's on an airplane going somewhere. Uh, so I will be doing the presentation tonight. Um, All right. I guess I will just share the screen. Um, so welcome. My name is Dan Wagner. I am the assistant director for SIP, the SIP program within the pedestrian unit of the NYC DOT. And tonight's presentation is about uh, the intersection of Broadway at Graham and at Flushing Avenues. Um, some quick background on where and Dan, we're Dan, about. what is SIP for the uh, street improvement projects? It's DOT speak for. Got you. Okay. In-house projects like like Preston was just talking about. Got it. Um, so the project here is at is is highlighted in red at this intersection uh, below the the elevated um, and Flushing and Graham. Uh, this is a request from the community. This is also a request from NYPD. This is also something that the DOT would would have loved to have identified uh, earlier if we had noticed it. Um, the area is within the bid, the Graham Avenue bid. So we have been working with them a little bit. Um, and it is also at three major vehicular corridors, which has been a challenge in the design. Um, Flushing and Broadway are both truck routes. Heard a lot about truck routes in the last uh, presentation. Um, and there are a lot of, it's a multimodal hub. You've got the J train and the M train. And they've also got the, the all, a bunch of buses that all go through the intersection. Um, and then south of the intersection is the Woodhull Hospital. So what we find is that there's a lot of activity and action going on um, at this location. Um, in 2014 and then again in 2021, this site had fatalities, uh, pedestrian fatalities, which is unfortunate. Um, and Sometimes fatalities are more preventable versus less preventable. And we believe that the one in 2021 is definitely could have been prevented if we had uh, done this street proposal uh, beforehand. So we uh, wanna show you some of that. Uh, the, the existing conditions um, is that the intersection, the actual intersection, this is getting into the weeds of DOT a little bit, but the actual intersection of Broadway and Flushing is a signalized, controlled, normal intersection um, in, ter in, in terms of control. But Graham Avenue, the intersection of Broadway and Graham, is not controlled. That basically means that vehicles turning onto Graham from Broadway must yield to pedestrians in the crosswalk. And that sounds pretty s standard and normal. Um, but what we found is that due to the unique geometric layout of this intersection, um, it can be a little misleading. And a vehicle driving east on Flushing and turning left onto Graham would see the signal at Broadway. They would see the signal, they would think they have the green light, and then they would start turning. And that would mean that they're now approaching Graham Avenue as a head-on, which is not 
what DOT prefers in, you know, the best kind of street design. And so uh, it creates a conflict, as you can see in the, in the graphic on the bottom left, this uh, red truck, if you drive straight, he's going to drive straight into the, probably, I'm guessing it's a USPS uh, worker. And so it creates a conflict in that. Um, is, is something that we think we can fix in street design. Additionally, the actual width, the curb to triangular island width is wide enough that you can, as you can see in the photo, uh, two vehicles can drive through it at the same time, especially if somebody's driving a little aggressively, they might want to floor it and go around the other guy. Um, and so I think, I don't, I don't think you need me to explain why this is a dangerous condition. Um, but if you do, let me know. Um, we also found, is, as was evidenced in the 2014 issue, uh, pedestrian desire lines for crossing this intersection are often outside of the marked crosswalks. And, you know, that's partly because of the location of the subway stairs. The green arrow on the right is pointing to where the subway stair meets the sidewalk. And if somebody's trying to, to go southeast on Broadway, they're just as likely to walk to the to walk straight across Flushing Avenue as they are to walk down towards the intersection and do it more safely. Um, and if you stand at the intersection of Graham and Broadway, you'll notice lots and lots of pedestrians, just as you can see in the picture, just walking sort of all over the place, and uh, and it's not as aware to the drivers of what's going on. So in our toolkit, I, I'm going to fly through this because. I think you've already heard about toolkits tonight, um, but this is an in-house project. So these are some of our in-house tools that we have, uh, but not capital projects, you know, that kind of stuff, the, the bigger, more extensive stuff. So the proposed design is what you are seeing on the screen, and I will go through each piece one by one. Um, so the first thing we would do is we would identify that in the in the existing condition, there's two um, there's the triangular island at Graham that I've kind of glossed over, but there's actually a create because of that triangular island, it creates two slip lanes, um, one on the south and one on the north of the triangle. So I'm going to refer to those that way. Um, so on the north slip lane for Graham and Broadway, um, we would actually widen this a little bit. We would remove the uh, existing triangle. There's a column in that triangle. We can't remove the column, but we can remove the triangle around it and then reshape the concrete around that column. Um, and by widening this northern slip, it can we can close the southern slip. Um, and so therefore, traffic who is driving like we were talking about before, flushing to Graham, they are now no longer going to be able to drive straight, which would help delineate proper turning movements and uh, make the drivers more aware of, of the pedestrians who are crossing the street there. Um, we could also reconfigure the, call it the Northwest corner of Flushing and Broadway. Uh, we're gonna, it's a little, it's, it doesn't meet DOT standards in terms of the way we would normally do a radius at an intersection. Um, we would like to clean that up a little bit. We find that there's people standing, pedestrians are standing in, in the roadway at this location awfully a lot um, because they can, they know that traffic isn't going to be here. So we would just like to formalize that and make it quite a bit safer. Um, and then finally, we would flare the crosswalks uh, that Two of the crosswalks are already flared. It's the northern and eastern crosswalks of this intersection. Um, we would flare those to accommodate the pedestrian desire lines that we're seeing, which will help uh, drivers understand that they are in a crosswalk and hopefully drive a little more cautiously. Um, finally, the lastly, the um, the bus stop that exists today at the intersection of Graham and Broadway would be relocated to. Um, just before the intersection at Flushing and Broadway, uh, this would consolidate bus stops. And uh, as it says on the screen, this this is what DOT and the MTA, after quite a bit of back and forth, uh, have determined is the best uh, the best proposal for this intersection. Um, here's a photo of the of the intersection, and this is our rendering suggesting what we would envision it to look like when we're done. Uh, this rendering has some planters uh, and some hoop racks for bicycles on the 
on the actual construction of the of the pedestrian space. Um, we are currently working with the Graham Avenue bid to finalize this, but this is just a suggestion. Um, and again, this proposal, it creates shorter, safer crossing distances, which is always better for pedestrians. It also um, widens the crossing to the subway stairs. I went over that. It improves accessibility. It makes it uh, better for you know people with disabilities. And uh, it clarifies the vehicular movements. And, and I think that one's the big one for something like this. It's really a lot of the issues at this location have to do with um, pedestrians not sure what the vehicle is going to do or the vehicle not sure what the pedestrian is going to do. And so a, a project like this really cuts down on, uh, on a lot of that confusion. Um, and it, it really identifies, hey, if I'm in this crosswalk, this driver is going to know that I'm here and they don't they have to wait for me. They can't try and go around me and maybe go a little too fast. Um, that is me doing this on the quick side. I can do it again slowly if you want, but I think that there are probably some questions and I would we'll get into the details with your questions. Uh, thank you, Dan. <clears throat> um, so I just off the top of my head, I, I like this proposal, but um, you know, I've seen so many near misses at this intersection and I'm on it quite a bit. Um, and I think having that built out plaza um, closing off that slip is is a great solution. Uh, will there be signage put on that on that pillar or um, something to alert motorists when they're making that new right turn, assuming that after your discussions with the bid, that's the way it's going to look? Um, what's going to go in there to uh, to alert motorists so besides the new pattern? Just you know, to make them alert. And um, that's that's really my only concern with that. Yeah, I mean, we'll definitely have uh, signs, especially the signs that have the yellow, it says N-E-W underneath it. Like it's, a, it's called, we call it a new rider. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that'll be up for 60 days after implementation, uh, minimum 60 days. So, so we'll put those up. I, I don't have a sign plan um, developed. I usually let the engineers design it to their, you know, they have all the standard specifications, but signs are definitely a part of this proposal. I didn't spend a lot of time with them uh, okay. because, you know, I don't have, I, don't have a, <laughs> I try to let right. the experts do their, okay. their work on it. And, and maybe it's just the way the, the images look, but it does look, and maybe you said this, and if I missed it, I'm sorry, it, that new crossing actually looks wider. And that's, is that correct? Talk about here? Yeah. Uh, let's go to a plan. That's gonna be a little more. It's it's the truth is that it is going to be it's gonna be what should be there now. I don't know what the existing width of that crosswalk is, but mm -hmm. the New York City standard for crosswalks is building line to two feet from the curb. So this the Bar Bariqua College building line is here. That'll give us where this edge is, and then we'll go to the curb and then go off two feet. So it'll be, that is what it should be now. I, I can't say if it is or not, but that's that's what the proposal will be. Okay. Okay, and uh, I see your note that it's, everything's going through MTA, so they can, buses will be able to make that turn. Turn yes. radius is fine, great, okay. Yes, we have confirmed that with, with them multiple times. They are on board with this proposal. Got it, okay. Um, that's all for me, committee. What's the, the t uh, I want to, well, thank you. It's a great plan. I, I bike through this intersection and it's like, can be chaotic and it really takes in, um, it's easy, it really feels like you've studied it. I'm curious what the timeline is because it's great. Um, with a positive result from this meeting, um, we are actually expecting to begin work in maybe as soon as June. Right on. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other committee members? Uh, public for a 30 second comment. <laughs> Just because we're running out of time here. No? Okay. Uh, anybody? My hand wanna... is up, Eric. My hand is up. Oh, I can't, I can't see. I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. 
Thank you, Dan. This is a this is great. This is a great plan. And closing that slip lane. I mean, we've been looking at slip lanes all over the neighborhood like this that cause so much chaos and difficulty for folks. So, you know, kudos. This is really great. Um, I guess two quick questions. One is we had spoken with Woodhull Hospital a ways back about some of these intersections, some of these areas. So I don't know if you've had any conversations with them. Dr. Fishkin um, particularly has done a lot of their bike, like kind of public capacity work, and they had a lot of great ideas and thoughts um, that might help to inform the final plan. Um, we had spoken with them um, a ways back, um, and one of the main things they brought up was, I mean, they didn't call it daylighting, but, you know, um, cars parking way too close to the corners um, and lack of any sort of bike parking, um, any type of secure or like, you know, sufficient bike parking. Um, for the area, for the amount of folks that were, you know, coming to the hospital. Um, that was what we had discussed uh, back, I think it was June of last year. We, I, myself and a couple of other folks that uh, were interested in this area down here, closing that slip lane was one thing that we had talked about. So it, it's really great to see it. Um, but I just was wondering if, you, if, if all these intersections currently in this new plan are, I mean, I see some, but if all the intersections are daylit, um, and, uh, open like that. Um, and also, uh, I know you said a couple of hoop, uh, bike parking spots in the plaza, but if there's any further, uh, bike parking that was explored, um, around there, particularly in the roadbed. So, yeah, we're still working out the details. We want to be a good partner with the bid for this space because they are going to likely be our partner to maintain it and, and keep it sort of from becoming, a less than desirable place. Um, so if it, we can put in more hoop racks, uh, like like are shown here, su suggested here, uh, but it's it's really it's a conversation between the you know what the bid thinks is going to be. I, I you know I want to be a good partner here. Like what what do you guys want? Like tell us you know. Um, but I'll tell him uh, I'll tell the bid when we talk to him that uh, you know community board was recommending more bike parking for this area. Um, there is currently some bike parking. You can see it in the picture actually right here. Um, there is yeah. bike parking on the far side of the street as well. We were not exploring more locations for bike parking, but that doesn't mean we can't, uh, we just, it was, we were focused so much on the pedestrian and traffic reconfiguration that, um, you know, there's, there's, you can see there's a hoop on the, at the very bottom of the picture as well. Uh, yeah. U rack, I think that one's called, and uh, and so there's there's plenty of space, there's plenty of opportunities. It's the kind of thing that once this is done, we'd like to make sure that we check where the curbs are, make sure that traffic is operating the way we went, and then that kind of thing we can we can come back to easily and and continue to tinker. And, and what about daylighting? I apologize. What about daylighting uh, for the corners? I know I it, obviously in the initial thing that you had showed, there's some cars kind of parked up close to the corner there. Not in this instance, but. Um, and I know that's just kind of a rough, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure where you're talking about actually, do you talk uh, about in the like... bird's eye, the bird's eye view, uh, layout map? Yeah. Yep. Oh, you mean like, uh, this one? Yeah. So like you have, um, at Broadway and Flushing at the triangle corner, I mean, uh, like, right. So this, you can see my cursor, right? Yeah. Oh, to the yeah. left, to the yeah. left. I, where it says here? Broadway below the W. Like, I, I know that that might not be, but I'm just, I'm wondering if there's any type of like build outs that you guys are thinking about in those spaces, because those are going to be busy, busy, busy crosswalks, obviously, because you you know, you, you know that because you're flaring them out. Um, but the pedestrian traffic down there is is tremendous. Yeah, this is one of the more stunning levels of pedestrian volumes that I've seen. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's not part of this plan. If you want to request to daylight that spot, that's easy enough to incorporate. Um, it's, it's, I, this is a signalized intersection. So I don't, there are places where day, I like daylighting everywhere, but there are places where daylighting is more effective and less effective. But I would say that this isn't as necessary just because of the, um, because of the, the signal there that anybody who's turning right is going to be yielding to these pedestrians this while. Well, maybe it doesn't make sense. Um, I think sure, the if, more you wanna, if you want to, if you want to put that request in, uh, we would be happy to take a look at it. I think the more space you're making for for safety for pedestrians in this area, especially with the level of the level of volume and like you know the fact that you're doing so much amazing, you know so many so many amazing improvements. I think the daylighting would be um, you know wherever possible to add daylighting. 
uh, would be a, a great improvement. And then also, uh, you know, I, I'd be happy to send along Dan, or I could send it to Eric, the email and contact information for the folks at Woodhall that we spoke to who had a lot of great ideas as you guys are finalizing. We, we got a, we had a com, we had a contact, uh, but they didn't respond. Did they? Ron? Jessica Orocho, maybe? Yeah. So, um, so I'm sorry. So, uh, Woodhall hospital is actually not in community board 1 and, uh, my, my coworker, uh, Leroy Branch is the liaison for community board 1. He, I, I thought he was involved in the notification to, to Woodhall hospital, but I think that for, you know, for like additional bike racks and the direct vicinity of the hospital, it would probably be most effective for the hospital to engage with their liaison directly. Um, it doesn't seem like it would be a request that would come from community board one is all I'm saying. Um, or I, you could put that request in yourself, Kevin, to the web form. Yeah, uh, I, anyone I could really request um, additional bike parking anywhere. And, and if it meets the siting criteria, we would definitely consider doing it. Yeah, that's what I was trying to say, and I didn't say it very clearly. The bike parking request is, doesn't need to be associated with a, the street improvement project like this like that's a, a different sort of right it's like ongoing and completely yeah. separate yeah these are sort of one time we come in we do this big lift and the, the bike parking thing can come and go yeah i just the primary things like i said that's so me a year ago thanks kevin time. we, we right. got to move on any other um any other comments from the public eric as an fyi uh yeah. while woodhall is not in our district we sent them the proposed design they did not reply Got it. Thank you, Jerry. Right, as did we. Eric, this is Kevin. Um, I have a comment or actually more of a question. Would it be in scope to just make a comment about the lighting in the area? I know that like my bike, for example, was stolen in, in this area. And I think that like some lighting improvements might also help in this pedestrian plaza here. But I, let me know if that's out of scope um, for this improvement. No. I can actually answer that. We we've already had these conversations. Um, it's not in this proposal because they hadn't finished yet. But uh, the the conversation was, do you see this? There's a light pole right here that's already lighting the basically the plaza. You know, it's currently it's a roadway. Um, the question was, do we need to move that or not? And we're I'm pushing to not move it and then add additional lighting. I think over here. Um, I'm not sure that hasn't been decided yet. We're currently our lighting contract is in limbo. So we have to wait for that to, to be re-signed um, before we can come up with it. But if you could put it in your, you know, if you have a letter of support or recommendation uh, to look at lighting, that would be something that I think would we could look at. Can you add an additional arm off that post? Well, the, the currently the, the arm is going in the right direction. So I don't think we need to touch it. Uh, or maybe but, one, maybe one, going off in the direction down Graham. Oh, like the additional towards lighting the, to the towards uh, the Linksys. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can, we can. Easy enough to do. I, I, I don't, I don't. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't know anything about lighting, so I can't answer a yes or no. But I can definitely put that in an email to the lighting folks. And on the west side of the the crosswalk too. No. I don't think they would put one on each side. I think that's okay. a little uh, too much. But too much. if we. Can, but one one over here, so that way the two of them are coming together. Although know. that is a dark corner because of the train. Yeah, yeah, I think if it's very feasible to, you know, I would like more lighting. All right, so we'll, okay, we can make that a recommendation. Anything else, Kevin? No, thank you. Thank you, okay, any other committee? Okay, would somebody like to make a motion? Um, I'd like to make a motion um, to support this proposal, um, but with three caveats that DOT uh, take a look into adding additional lighting, additional bike parking, and then considering um, daylighting whenever possible. Those would be the three recommendations I have um, in addition to supporting the proposal. So support as presented. Mm -hmm. Eric, the chair was pretty emphatic that there's no vote of the board required on this item. So, but you you could certainly entertain a vote on uh, yeah, just a, for a additional support. modifications. Yeah, a letter of support. Mm -hmm. And I will say that we 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 always welcome a letter of support, whether right. we yeah. require it or not. 
We, we didn't require a vote, but certainly a, a right. letter of support is, is always appreciated. Thanks. Thanks for that clarification, Jerry. Yes. Uh, okay. So letter of support uh, for the presentation with the following. We'll do recommendations again. Uh, additional lighting, additional bike parking, and daylighting wherever possible. Those were my recs. Any other recommendations, committee? Is there a second? Sure, I'll, I'll second, second it. It's Paul. Well, yeah. Paul? Okay. Yeah. Paul and Kevin. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I vote in favor, sorry. Yeah, I'm in favor too. Couldn't get my thing off. Okay. Opposed? Extensions? Motion carries. Okay. Uh, Dan, thank you very much. Um, I, I really think this is going to save lives. Um, I, I've puzzled over this intersection for years, and I'm really happy to see these these improvements coming, coming through. Thank okay. you, Dan, for joining me. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Righty, moving right along. Okay, so we are up to a discussion on the district needs statement. Um, Jerry sent around um, the process. Oh, I, I reached out to Jerry to, to ask him to just um, we could indulge him to just give a little uh, insight onto the process, but. Uh, Gina has joined us. I think Gina is still on the call. Okay. Yeah, yes, there she is. You Thank know, you. Oh, you're welcome. I asked, um, do, you, do you hear me? I, yes. Oh, good, good, because I, I had problems with my computer. I, I worked on a presentation, and I'm thinking that it's going to be a little longer, because you finish at 9, right? Um, um, it's, it's only because... Yeah. I think it's important to go, go ahead. Gina. No, no, no. Because here's here's what I here's what I'd like to do, and and I've said this to Ryan a little bit. And I think I've said it in, in the committee meetings before. Mm -hmm. Is that in order to do a proper district need statement where transportation is concerned, I I would like to do this over the course of a, a few meetings, um, so that we're not trying to do everything at once, uh, which is which is crazy. So. Um, so really the purpose of, of this, um, and I really want to thank Ryan for, for pushing this to, to make it, to make it happen is to, you know, get, uh, and Gina, I'm so glad that you, that you came to just go ahead and give your presentation. No, no, um, that's, that'll, that's the thinking to do. Yeah, that'll give, that'll give the committee a, a good idea of what is and what is not possible, um, within the district confines of the district need statement and how the city responds to it. Um, and um, I will give you the floor. Okay, let me see if I can share. If not, I have to read it. Let me just see. Um, and Jerry, if you'll just indulge us, I, I, I don't expect to go past maybe 9.15, so. Yeah, uh, no worries, you still have to answer that new business item. What's that? You still have that new business item. Yes, I know. Because I know you have people on the call for that. I'm aware, I'm aware. Okay, thank uh, you. All right. Gina, go ahead. I'm not good at the screen sharing here. Um, I'm going to read it and I'm going to just involve, get involved in a discussion. Let me just review what, you know, you, you have the um, PowerPoint that was sent to everybody, right? Yes. Good, good. Did, did folks take a look at that? Um, that PowerPoint that went, it's a three page PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, well, we begin to you have it in your input. I'm, I'm going to forward it again right now. I'm just going to reply to it so like folks could, but uh, it was sent to the committee uh, uh, Monday, I believe. So, so I agree okay. with you. This, this is the beginning of a discussion so we can work. I mean, I, my thinking is for the budget committee to work with all committees. Um, there's a lot um, of work that we need to begin. So what we pretty much say the community board participation in the budget project process. Under the city charter, community boards are given a broad range of responsibilities for advising the city about local budget needs and priorities. The statement of, this is 
the supporting informed planning and budgeting decisions. Statement of community district needs describes the needs of the district and recommendation for programs, projects, or activities to meet those needs, plus community board budget requests, which um, includes, and this is the important part, um, we're given 40 capital budget request items and 25 expense budget request items. And what happens is those items are prioritized so that later I will show you the statement so we can go on. Okay. Top three prior priorities. Oh, let me go down. Yeah. We have three priorities. We identify three pressing issues. Um, most important by policy area and by budget request. And for our community board one, we have the affordable housing, we have parks and open space, we have Greenpoint and Williamsburg communities are growing in population and new businesses, waterfront development. Um, there's in a tremendous increased need enhanced for public safety. Our streets are overburdened with traffic and we seek relief from the constant wear and tear in our roadways. And priority is the maintenance of the infrastructure, street resurfacing, street light repairs. And this is included in the statement of our top priorities, but also included in that statement are the other community needs priorities that address youth and senior services, mental health services, educational services, funding for library operations, sanitation services, and uh, as well as um, the uh, educational services. Okay. And I did highlight in the report, and I think this is very important that based on the census, the Brooklyn population has increased by 9.2, and it's now the fourth largest city Williamsburg and Greenpoint have experienced um, the greatest increase in population, and this huge increase in population should be in proportionate to an increase in funding. And I also would question why we have such limited number of items that we are given. I mean, last year we had 28. I, this year I think we were given 40. So of, of all these needs, we're only given like 28 items for the capital budget, and 25 for the um, expense budget. Here is the timeline that I broke up, I, I outlined here. Um, preliminary budget is released in January with the preliminary budget document. Agent so Gina, just, just to interrupt you for a second. So I, I just forwarded that, uh, the presentation to everybody again. So if, um, Oh. I'm looking at it myself right now. So if anybody on the committee wants to look at it. Oh, good. Go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. I was going to put it on the screen. Eric, I didn't, sorry to interrupt. I didn't get the attachment of what you forwarded. Just, I don't know if others are having that problem, but I'll see what. Right, let me, let me do it again. Let me do it again. Maybe I didn't, forgot to include it, but I did reply all. So usually it comes through. Go ahead. This here. My crochet message. I just don't understand whiteboard. File. Share file window. I don't know. I, I'm this is like not being able. I would love to be able to share it, but okay. Anyway, the the timeline I is the preliminary preliminary budget register is released in January with other with other preliminary budget documents. Agency responses are published in February of 2022. The statement on the preliminary budget are called letters of comments or charter required, and they reflect the budget's reaction to the responses received mostly from the agencies in the fiscal year 2023. This statement helps both um, the borough president, council members um, decide in June on local budgeting and provides the Office of Management and Budget Analyst to review the statements on behalf of the mayor for the upcoming executive budget. In April, the executive budget is released. 
and we received the Office of Management Budget Response. The Capital Budget Committee reviews and discusses the Office of Management Budget Response, and we will be having a May 17th meeting that everybody is invited. Um, we, June is adopted, budget is released, the borrow budget consultation meeting in September. Um, they have borrow consultation meetings um, that I wanna share uh, this year with everybody. Um, they, Marie allowed me, Maria, Mar uh, Marie was very helpful last year and she um, included me in, in the budget consultation meetings that were online and there were about 20 of them but um, they were between 20 to 30 minutes, and I think they were very valuable in terms of attending. Um, and I can share that with the committees um, this coming this coming year. June adopted budget is released, borrow budget consultation meetings in September. They provide meeting notes, and then the executive register contains the same broad requests and priorities. Office of Management Budget updates the response since the executive budget is the mayor's budget. A final register is published after the budget is adopted. The adopted register contains response that reflects the changes made to the executive budget by the city council. And in November, the statement of district needs for this fiscal year 2024 is presented to the full board for a vote and is submitted. Now, Prioritizing district needs. We were given one to 28, which is the budget, capital budget priorities, um, which covers for the capital budget, construction, recon, uh, construction programs, reconstruction of streets, sewers, parks, and buildings. Expense budget priority has 25 request items, again, prioritized from one to 25. Um, and this covers all day um, uh, services such as salaries and operations, supplies. Okay. Um, in November of 2021, the Office of Management and Budget asked that the statements of the community district needs be organized by agencies, which is what I did. And if everybody has, and everybody will, if you go into the um, community board website, you will see the statement for the fiscal year 2023 that was approved in November of 2021. And it would be good to work with it because it's organized by agencies. It has an explanation and it will highlight the budget requests. For example, the capital budget priority item 13 through 20 is a request for reconstruction of streets. There's a description of the streets with an explanation and designated agency, which is the transportation department. And um, we will review to see if this request was funded or not. And then what will we do if they did not fund it? Because that's, they could say we denied it and we will say, well, no, we, we don't agree. Um, but it's important to look through the statement. Um, as I have to say, I put a lot of work in, in the sections on agency, explanation, and priority request. Next. Okay, this is the important part, and this is the part where I, this year I, I want to work more with the committees and improve communication. Um, okay, so written comments were received, and we received a lot of them from the community board members, from the public, um, and also comments were received um, at the public hearings. Also last year, I did um, the, some committees were involved, other committees not as much. I reached out to the educational committee. I believe this year we should have all committees involved. Um, and we participated in the review of the agency responses, the, the written comments, and we discussed the changes needed to be made and if we needed to change the priorities. And only three very minor changes were made. Um, and it continued, the district um, needs report continued similar to the prior reports. 
And um, with Marie, who was very helpful, I was able really to go back and review reports going back to 2012 um, and a lot of other documents that she provided. The statements on district needs and letters of comments is also sent and it was sent in March. Um, and there's an uh, agency response to those comments. Now, website provides tools that are very valuable and I will share them and you might be very familiar with them, but however, we have the citywide statement of needs, SON for the fiscal year 2023. We have the register of community board request for fiscal year 2023 for the preliminary budget. We have the office of management budget response. We have the district um, community district profiles and the community district sites. And I found looking through all of them that office of management budget response was very helpful and valuable because it did respond and gave very good response to the fiscal year 2023 statement of district needs. So that's um, what we're working with here. Um, I do want to say that this was my first year, but I did have the help of former um, chairpersons and Del T um, is my co-chairperson and she's been, been very helpful and so has Marie. Um, but as I said, my goal is really to work with the committees and begin to see how we can move forward and, and starting now and in, in, in working on the district needs. And that's my presentation. I rushed through it, but there it is. Any any comments? The time is 8.45. Oh, I mean, I think oh, thank you. Yeah, that, was a, that was an amazing overview of the process. Oh, like, thank, thank you. So through it a little bit because I was worried about the time, but thank you. No, Gina, that that was great. Thanks a lot. There's a lot of information packed in there. Um, I did forward uh, that PowerPoint and also uh, the current uh, district needs statement um, just now uh, to the committee. Um, the transportation section starts on page 27 of the DNS. So um, for folks that want to refer to that and like i like i said at the beginning like you know we're not here to to do the district needs session in the next 15 minutes this is a very um it's going to be a labor intensive process for the committee and we'll it'll be on the agenda for the next few meetings to kind of like dig down and 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 um get you the information that you need gina um to I, uh to come to the meetings the i'm willing to I invite me and i'll come because it's very valuable i felt a little bit like when we got done there's so much i mean there's the park and open space there so if we can just look at just transportation and come to a meeting and do that that'll be great so that we can look at parks and we you know and we can really work without coming down to just our one meeting where there's a lot of material to to look at so yes, I, I will come to the um, transportation meetings. Thank you, time. Gina. Um, committee, any any questions or comments? Like, and again, like I said, this is just a kind of a how it works um, section. Uh, Eric, or, I have a question. Who's that? It's Aaron Drinkwater. Go ahead, go ahead, Aaron. Um, do we have examples of what? district uh, needs we've submitted in the past that have actually been funded? Um, yes. Um, I, I mean, yes, we do. I would have to review them, but. Because I, I think it's just my, as you know, a newer member, it might be helpful to see what's been funded in the past. Okay, but that's a good question. I'll, I'll review, I'll, I'll research that, but I believe we do. Hey, thanks, Gina. Can, can I speak? Uh, this is Brian. I would love to answer the question. A little, one of the reasons why I've been bugging Eric to do this is I was having a conversation with Ben Solitaire, and he was saying in the city budget process in the council's office, they constantly referred to the district needs statement and the statement, and it, it was what helped them win budget battles and get things for the district. And so I, at the time, was like, wow, I don't even think we really, like, I was like, I didn't realize it was so important for the city council person. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Ryan. It's good to know. Yes. 
because um, I, I saw that um, Lincoln Ressler responded that he received the district needs statement and um, well, they were working with it. I, I mean, he, it was good to, I saw that response. So can I ask a question, Eric? Um, yeah, well, oh, I'm sorry, is that Paul? Paul, yeah. yeah so go if, ahead, Paul. So if, if it sounds like it's kind of gonna be on the agenda for the next few months, so like, what is the format look like? I mean, should we each be generating a list of things we'd like to see included? And how are how do we propose that and, um, and come to agreement about what the priorities are? Wait, can I have a suggest that maybe at our next meeting, we, we set up a timeline of how we would take input and like put together a schedule. Like we we now know what the, the Gina gave us the overall timeline. So I feel like we can all research and sit with that information and like at the next meeting, set the goals for ourselves so that we then have the next month to work, blah, blah. Yes, I, th I think that's best, Ryan. I, and I think we've talked about that before. So, Paul, bring bring a list at the next meeting, and and we'll start digging into it. Uh, Eric, I have a question. Is that um, Kevin? Go ahead. And and maybe Rhonda or Gina could could answer this. Uh, should we be thinking about projects that city has never heard of before? Should we be looking at like more capital or expense needs? Capital being like infrastructure projects versus expense being like more like the SIP projects we heard about earlier. I'm not exactly sure. That's a good question. Um, well, I, Gina or Jerry, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, we're, we'd be looking at both capital and expense projects, no? Oh, yes, both capital and expense projects. And what, what I can do is for the next meeting is I will review, because uh, um, I will review the agency responses, response and responses to the um, district needs um, 2023 um, statements. Because what I was looking at is some of them were like, wait, they said. I have to take another look. It didn't look good. I'm shocked they would say to <laughs> wait. <laughs> it's, it's a good, it's good fun. We don't have the funding right now. So anyway, I will I will bring that in and we, we could look at that because I was trying to, you know, look. And it. And if I could clarify my earlier question is, do you know for existing projects, should we be like saying, hey, where's the follow up on it and, and almost using this as an accountability measure? Yes. Or is that okay? Yes, I would say that. And that's what we did last year. I mean, we were like a lot of the projects were like, we don't have the funding. Mm -hmm. or we're like denied and we said, why? And we said, no, we have to keep them on the list and advocacy work. But advocacy work is, is not that easy, you know, but for every every group has to be an advocate. That's why I believe that every committee has to work on advocating for their um, district needs. Thank you. Anybody else? <clears throat> okay, for, for this, I'm gonna limit. I'm going to limit this to uh, to committee only on this item, just because it was just informational. Um, as uh, as Ryan said, we'll uh, and I agree with we will take this up at the next meeting to set some goals and to have a um, more discussion on detail. Um, and so, Gina, again, thank you very much for making the time uh, and doing the presentation. Uh, folks, look over the the presentation that was sent around as well as the district needs statement for transportation starting on page 27 and um and we'll take this up again next month okay thank you okay thank you very much Gina. very thank i enjoyed you. the meeting
It was very good. Okay, I appreciate you coming. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay. Um, it is eight fifty four, and we are approaching item number five, which is old business. Uh, Rhonda, I believe, had something for old business. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Committee, committee first. Anybody? Committee first. Old business. I mean, you know me, the BQE wife exit. <laughs> right. Okay. We're, we'll uh, we'll we'll talk offline and, and and coordinate that with uh, with Simon and some other folks, and and DOT and state DOT. Uh, okay. Hearing no other, uh, Rhonda. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. So, um, Kyle Gorman. Who's been the liaison for the open streets program? He had an announcement to make, but he had to be at another meeting and he asked me to read this for him. Um, DOT is excited to announce that on May, uh, Saturday, May 4th, 14th, from noon to 4 p.m., DOT will host a design workshop as the agency continues to embark on public engagement and design development for a project to upgrade. The very open street with public space improvements and traffic calming measures. The project will reflect a number of considerations based on feedback we've heard from the community, including adding new bike and pedestrian infrastructure, commercial loading zones, accessibility, and maintaining emergency vehicle access. The workshop will be held outdoors on very open street exact location to be determined, and we will share a flyer for you to promote the design workshop soon. Um, I'm happy to also forward this to you, perhaps in the morning, if you need to like include it in your notes. Um, and then there's yes, also, Ronnie, if you could email that to me, that'd be great. And there's an, there's an email address specifically that goes directly to the open streets program. If anyone has any questions about that, um, Normally, I would write it into the chat, but you don't have that. Do you, you want me to give that um, that email address? Sure, go ahead. Sure. So it's openstreets at dot.nyc.gov. Say that one more time, please. Openstreets at dot.nyc.gov. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, and just email me that that statement. I'll I'll include it in the in the record for the report. Sure, I'll do that. Okay. Any other old business going once, twice? Okay, new business. Um, Eric, uh, sorry, Eric, my hand, my hand was up. I just had a quick question about Meeker, if 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 I could. Okay. I promise I'll keep it short. Rhonda, do we know um, when construction will be starting on, I guess, uh, on Meeker again for the spring um, and also for Collier Triangle? Do we have any type of uh, date set for either of those spaces? Um, I don't have that information off the top of my head. I, I do know that um, the Collier Triangle construction, I believe, is imminent. Um, I, I'm going to need to, uh, follow up with that information. Cool. Thank you. Thanks Kevin. Okay. Okay. New business committee. Community board members. Ms. McKeever, baby. Trina, I see her there. <coughs> Maybe she buzzed out. Uh, any other committee members have new business? I could bring it up, but I, I think Trina is deep in it, so it'd be better for her to Do you want me to bring it up? There, here's yeah, the 
they're, 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 I feel like they were here to ask Rhonda about DOT enforcement of the open restaurant program. Yeah. Or ask DOT. Yeah. So it, and it's specific to. Trina's back. Oh, good. Okay. Trina. Trina, you're recognized if you want to go ahead. I see her struggling with the, <coughs> with the mute. <clears throat> All right, and so Trina can can get in. So yeah, just uh, on, on our, at the end of the um, at the full board meeting, it came up. Well, not at, at the end. I guess it came up during um, liquor licensing. During the public well, session. Public session, yeah. So uh, uh, or the board meeting um, regarding uh, <clears throat> the the specifically the taqueria on um, on Oak. Which does not have a liquor license, <clears throat> and Trina, you there? Now I'm here. I'm okay. You're breaking up a little bit, but let's. I'll I'll recognize you. Go ahead. Susan. Oh, hello. Thank Read address for the business. Oh, there it we is. go. Okay, uh -huh. Trina, go ahead. Um, can you hear me, you guys? I, I don't know if you can hear me. If everybody can mute, that might help. You know, Eric, I'm in a moving car in a place with bad, bad connection. Maybe one of my neighbors can talk. That might be gotcha. Enough. Okay. Susan, do you want to go? Um, sure. Thank you very much for recognizing. Sure. Um, so, uh, what Trina was going to speak to is the situation involving Tacaria Rivera, which is located at the corner of Franklin Street and Oak Street. Um, they have applied for a a street open street uh, structure on uh, under ninety four. Uh, Franklin Street, which is the official address of the restaurant. However, we believe, we being the neighbors, believe that you know, the application is misleading because they are taking the approval by the DOT to allow them to actually build a structure on Oak Street. As you know, Franklin is a pretty Big street. It's got wide sidewalks. There are a number of open restaurant structures already on Franklin. Oak, on the other hand, is very small. Where they're looking to build it also has two tree beds. The space between uh, their property line and the tree bed is barely four feet. Um, they may even brush the branches of the tree where they build it there, but they it definitely does not meet the criteria that the DOT has set of a minimum eight feet, uh, you know, space for passageways. And in fact, they have pretty much taken over the sidewalk with the unpermitted use with portable benches, as it were. The neighbors have been, you know, trying to work with them for the past eight months has only gotten worse and it seems to have gotten to a point now where they just moved ahead to try and build a structure on oak street so we um, beg the community board and the dot if they could look into this before they actually try and erect a structure which they tried to do last friday uh, so that it doesn't turn into a situation where it's like, whoops, you know, we really did mean it for it to be approved for 94 Franklin. I mean, as they had, you know, applied for, <laughs> and there's a structure on Oak Street. Does that pretty much sum it up, uh, Trina? And if other, I know that I also have others on the call from Oak Street and, you know, if they might chime in as well, I'll appreciate it. It, that's that's 
the meat of it as I understand it, Susan, but um, uh, I'll entertain a couple other Oak Street. And you're and just 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 to be clear, you're the Oak Street uh, Block Association. Yes, I am not the Oaks. I, I am ah. a member of Oak Street. Uh, the two co-heads of the Oak Street Block Association are Trina and right. Alyssa Ilberti. Right, 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 right. However, I'm one of the new neighbors and and Maggie, um, who is on the call, is actually uh, lives right next to um, the restaurant. There are many other issues as well involving that restaurant, but you know, for purposes of the DOT uh, and the and the transportation committee, these are the pertinent points. Right. Yeah. I just I just want to keep it to the restaurant shed. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Uh, yeah. Can, can I respond to some of that or do you go ahead, Rhonda? You go don't ahead. Go ahead. So, um, I, I, I'm pretty, um, I, I haven't visited the location, but I have looked up at it on, um. On Google maps, and I spoke to the police and I spoke uh, also to the restaurant and I've got numerous emails from from, I guess, some people that are, you know, the, the neighbors on Oak street. And I spoke to the, the inspectors um, who inspect the open restaurant uh, structures. And from everything that I understand that certainly their mailing address is 94 Franklin Street, but they, uh, there's nothing that precludes them from putting a structure uh, on the street in front of their frontage if the uh, if it meets the criteria, and certainly the parking regulations there are are alternate side street parking regulations, so they are able to put a structure. They're permitted to put a structure um, there. And as I'm a little confused, the tree beds are up against the curb, right? So that having the structure or not having the structure wouldn't impact the. <laughs> The clearance between the tree bed and the front of the restaurant. It's not so much as the tree bed itself. It's just that yeah, you know, there's only four feet between the tree bed and the restaurant. And right. And so, so having a structure in the street would have no impact on that either way. They also are using the sidewalk right now, even though they're not permit. For it. And my understanding from looking at the DOT website is that in order to have one of the requirements for a street structure is uh, for, to have ADA compliant premises, which they don't. Well, I think that the structure has to be ADA compliant. I don't think we get involved Sometimes in the interior no, of their bathroom. restaurant. This says bathrooms. In fact, that's Rhonda, the, this is Trina. I, I, I don't know. I think I've got more bars right now. The restaurant opened after COVID, during COVID. So they, they knew what they, it wasn't like there was hardship on the restaurant. The mat, the owner chose to build out in what had been a coffee shop. It's really tiny. And the, the thinking of the neighbors is he did that knowing that he could expand on the street. And is it really fair for a restaurant owner to buy what is in essence a tiny restaurant where you can fit six or seven people comfortably at tables and then and, and spread it out onto the street on a quiet residential street that is totally disrupted by the noise and the volume of people on the sidewalk that will only be multiplied when you put a shed that's three times the size of the restaurant into the street. It just seems really inappropriate. Yeah, I, I, I understand that the neighbors aren't happy about it, um, but as long as it meets our criteria, then um, we, you know, we, we have to let them do it. I mean, the issues of noise, that's an enforcement issue with, with NYPD. But and the street address, the, the building that they're in runs 
is three times the size of the, what is the restaurant. And the shed that they're going to put will be the length of the building, which basically will triple the size. I mean, it, it, it just doesn't seem right that because if, the, if, if a restaurant takes up a tiny fraction of a building, that the shed can run the length of the building. I don't, I don't know if they can do that. Um, I know that they can put up the shed in the street for their frontage. Frontage um, of the restaurant itself. So the I know that they can, I know that they can put up the structure for the frontage of the restaurant. And then as to if they can expand beyond the frontage of the restaurant, um, with the permission of the landlord of the building. Well, he owns, he's renting the building. I mean, he's I, renting the ground floor, the owner of the restaurant. Right. So if I could just finish my sentence, because I sure, sorry. heard, sorry. you know, you guys out. Um, I was saying that um, I was asked that question by the owner today, if he can expand in front of the residential unit that's adjacent to his restaurant and yes, I know he lives in that residential unit, but, um, and he also says that he has the permission of the landlord. I, um, am looking into that. I don't have an answer, but I know that he can put the structure, um, for the width of his frontage for sure. And Rhonda, what about the two trees? Because they are very close to the street. If he were to erect a structure. It'll come within, it'll come very close. And when that also violate park regulations. I just, just a point of information. So at the, um, one of the shops I work at, uh, on Havemeyer, they have a, a restaurant shed, uh, and an additional seating area, which they did get permission from the landlord to put in and. You mean the beyond shed, the frontage? Yes, they, yes. they got permission. They, they wanted. So, if you're looking at it, they wanted the space to the right, which is a barbershop and they said, no. And so, and they're not the landlord, they're the, they're the, the tenant, but they said no, and then they couldn't get approval from the landlord, but then they asked the landlord of the property next. And they got that approval and there are tree beds. Right up against the, um, right up against the shed now in terms of ADA. So that is not an issue in terms of the cur the way the. The, um, uh, the restaurant shed criteria is currently operating, not to say that it won't change, but, um, but it also, it does have to be ADA compliant because we had to buy ramps, um, to access the sidewalk. It, shed. I mean, the street. Yes. Structure. When it was in, when it was in, when it was so. Originally, it was just in the roadbed, and we just had planters blocking out a section with no roof. Um, so we could only serve on nice days, but we had to have a ramp from the street bed up to the curb. And then when we built the proper shed, it was at curb level. So there was no, you could roll a, um, a wheelchair or walker or whatever. You can roll it right into the road, into the shed. Um, so that's just as a just, ADA compliance comes, if that right, if so that's just a point to be accessible. Right, that's just a point of clarification. Now, I mean, I feel like so DOT has their rule, and we've been inspected like fifteen times. So the inspectors are out there, um, you know, making us do all these like different tweaks and fixes, which we're always happy to do course, but, um, it, it feels, it feels like with, with this, with the council, um, you know, making these, making these permanent, um, it's a legislative fix. Um, because, uh, you know, I, I don't know, that's my sense is that it, it needs to be addressed by the electeds, um, to kind of rein in this, this. What is clearly based on what what I'm hearing about Takaria is just, uh, you know, it's just a grab for, um, mm -hmm. you know, for space that, you know, they're just exactly right. You know, they have a six, they have a six stool spot that should be a grab a taco and walk out 
and walk down the block or whatever, and they're deciding to make a restaurant because they can, because right now we're in this like nebulous. Yeah, it's like it's yeah, we're we're caught in a in a in a purgatory of like an emergency plan that is that needs to be codified better in in the law so that the agencies actually can have teeth to like rein in some of these you know some of them are saving businesses like um, they saved our business like i'm not even gonna have that argument but like trina said they opened during the pandemic and then they were like oh we can have a restaurant in the street and all of a sudden we've like increased our 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 square footage by you know 300 square feet it's ridiculous you know you know that might be true but i feel like i'm i'm you know i'm not in the position to that's not that really has no bearing here i understand what you're saying but it it, it doesn't have any bearing on them being allowed to do what they're allowed to do within the other criteria that's been laid out i mean there is no criteria that they had to exist before the pandemic started um, i'm sorry eric all of a sudden you're commuting sorry I know, I know it's, um, um, kind of, kind of lost in the way that the regulations are written right now, but, um, you know, if, if the storefront is 94 Franklin and Franklin is a business corridor, it should be on 94. The storefront is on Oak street. There is no frontage on, uh, Franklin. Yeah. See, that's, you know, I mean, they, they should have put in, I, I don't know. It's, it's. I feel like it's like one of those gray areas where they're just like, you know, gaming the system to like get this thing in there. And and Rhonda, you can only tell us what the regulations are. Um, so I'm not really coming for you on this. So just so you, just so we're clear, I'm just I'm just venting. Um, well, well, I do want to say though, in response, you know, anecdotally, if you may, that sure. there are restaurants that are on corners, right? So obviously their address is on one street or the other, not both. And yet they're permitted to have structures on both sides. I think that's crazy too. Okay. <laughs> I think that's Eric, insane Maggie, too. Maggie, who lives right next door has been trying to talk. Do you think you could call on? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, are, I've you, just, are you Maggie Murray, just for the record? I'm, I'm, I'm Maggie McInerney, actually, but my husband is Murray. Um, and can you I just actually, spell, is that Maggie? It's M-E-G-G-I-E. -E, and then uh -huh. my last name is M-C-I-N-E-R-N-E-Y. Um, I actually spoke at the community board meeting um, and just would like to layer on a few things. I think um, what Eric was saying is exactly right. Um, the capacity indoors of the taqueria only seats um, a maximum of, of 18 people. That's what they put in their plans um, for the neighborhood. And five of uh, people inside are actually working um, in the taqueria. Previously, we had um, a cute little coffee shop. And I think there was maybe on a, on a busy day, a maximum of five people inside. Um, one of the challenges that we're facing is that they do not have enough seating for um, for people who come to the restaurant. And actually, they do not offer takeout. That's written on their Instagram and, and, and publicly uh, shared. And so what's happening is they are having crowds line up. Some nights there's 30 to 50 people outside line up. They only serve on plastic plates, so everyone is required to um, eat on the street, on the sidewalk. They are blocking the sidewalk. They do not have um, a permit for a sidewalk cafe, but have been putting out benches. So the entire sidewalk is completely blocked. And I think our concern is that um, right now, if you are handicapped, if you are a mother with a stroller, with, as am I, um, if you are walking your dogs, there is just no way to cut through the crowds. Um, and then I do believe that um, the assumption, uh, we, our assumption is that they opened this storefront and it is a little misleading that they're actually 
building out an outdoor structure to create a larger capacity when inside they really, they, that's just not something that they have. Um, if I would be allowed, I have a few photos just to express what I'm sharing so you guys can see how this, the one, this uh, sidewalk is blocked. Um, and then I also just would like to add that in addition to renting the, um, uh, the commercial space, they also rent the apartment in front and the garages next to my house. Um, so it's a pretty large, um, a large uh, piece of property on Oak Street. And um, I think one of our challenges as well is that they are now without a certificate of occupancy or permits, building out the garage to be additional restaurant space. And I think one of the, the fears of the neighbors is that this outdoor structure is really going to take over our quiet residential street, um, given that they're illegally building out the garage. Um, but if I would be permitted, I'd love to share some photos just to kind of show what what is going on currently. <laughs> I think for the interest of time, if you want to email those to the to the board office, and I'll make it part of the record, um, but we're already 20 minutes past um, our out time. So I, I, I hear that. I appreciate that. I think the garage issue that was brought up in uh, the full board meeting, that's a Department of Health thing, because if I'm understanding that they're prepping in there, that is not a legal use of that space, um, which is different agency altogether. I, you know, I don't. I do, uh, I do want to make this an item for discussion in the transportation committee, but it's so wrought with like raw emotion and we've had enough emotional topics over the last two years and I'm, my brain is kind of fried with it, but it's since it's not really DCA anymore, uh, it's not SLA, um, you know, now the question is these benches that they're putting out, it used to be that if you put out a bench without a, uh, a DCA license for a sidewalk cafe, you were fined, you were busted, or you had to like take your, your stuff down. That, as far as I understand, and I think Tom Burroughs is, is who chairs the SLA committee is just as flummoxed as I am with this. There's, it's kind of like wild west for, with like these, and you know, we're coming out of pandemic and there were all these emergency business, blah, 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 blah. But now we got to rein this in. Like it's got to be codified in a, in a way and if it's going to fall to transportation, then we're going to have to we're going to have to take it up and make res rec recommendations and really push our electeds to, to you know, to create a balance for for neighbors. So, um, Trina, I think you wanted to uh, to draft a, a letter to. Uh, I think we should draft it to. Um, the mayor, the borough president. And the DOT um, and to our electeds, um, but uh, I'll I'll give it I'll give it to you because I think this was your idea. And Eric, I might speak uh, in that benches are always a deal. Uh, the Department of Transportation is called revocable right. consent. Uh, that si right. uh, sidewalk cafes that was DCA. That's now DOT. So everything we're talking about is DOT now. Thank you. Right. That's right. Yes, it was revocable <laughs> consent for the benches. But if you just threw out benches and like DOT didn't sign off on it, you know, you were in trouble, <laughs> right? So anyway, so uh, thank you, William, for that clarification. And um, the so, Trina, uh, go. Uh, so Eric, could could your committee write a could could we ask could your committee ask the, the community board write a letter on behalf of the residents of Oak Street about the situation that's going on? Um, with the Taqueria and we could, we could fill you in. I'm about, my phone's about to die and I'm about to go into a bad zone. So I can't, okay, okay. I can't, um, I can't give you all the specifics, but it's basically everything that we've just talked about, everything that Maggie's just said and Susan has just said, and I could follow up in the next day or two with an email that, that our group has put together and they, maybe you could run by for clarification with your committee. Well, can, can we do something like that where we don't have the specifics and it gets presented to the board? Um, Eric, I would like time to go and see the spot or see, like, I just feel like I don't want to vote on a letter without 
checking it out or hearing from the business person, it makes me slightly, I don't know. Can we like, I mean, that's, that's fair. I have seen the spot and it is problematic. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm over there on, on, on Franklin. Uh, the I was food today. is great. And the guy no, the food is great. Okay. And when, when we had the leverage of a liquor license, he agreed to a lot of stipulations. Right. That's, that a, that's an important cannot. point. And, right. and then once he didn't go for his liquor license, he was friendly for a while. And then it just has grown and grown. And now with the better weather, it's out of hand again. And the better weather has only just begun. And so yeah. I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about waiting. I, I don't know if the board can, I, Ryan, I understand what you're saying. And for your committee to vote on it without the specific letter, without, understand, without hearing both sides, I, I get that, but I wonder if there's a way that the, the board could consider it in how, the May meeting about, so that about, we don't let another month go. Okay, how about how about this? Um, Jerry. Oh. Jerry? Hi, this is Kevin. Um, Kevin, can go I, ahead. Can I just say, I, I think that that as a as a committee, um, we should be doing our best to connect individuals with the resources that they need to make their their opinions known and that we should be encouraging everyone on everyone who's affected on on oak street to reach out to their elected officials but i don't really know if a community board letter is is really appropriate in this in this circumstance i think that there's a lot of rulemaking and a lot of valid concerns in terms of exceeding capacity but i think that that is something that individuals should be raising to their elected officials and that and and to to Ryan's point, you know, like we we haven't seen the the like actual circumstance like on the ground. Like we don't have anything to work off of right now. And I think it would be premature, if not um completely out of scope for us to be writing a letter in support or 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 contrary to um just because, you know. People don't like a restaurant on their street. If they're within their legal right to do that, then they should be able to do that, even though, you know, there are some concerns that have been brought up that are very valid. I don't know. It's uh, lots of feels, but, you know, I, th I think that right now, as the rules are written, you know, it's within their right to be doing things to to be building out that space. As I think Rhonda has mentioned, you know, there are restaurants throughout the city that are building out on both sides of the street. And, you know, if they're exceeding capacity, then, you know, we should be having DOT come in and enforce that. But I think that's, that's really on individuals to go in and ask for that, right? Does the capacity of a shed have to relate to the capacity of the indoor space? No, not, not, that, I, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, and as far as the indoor oh, space, no. I mean, I don't think DOT has oversight over capacity on this. They don't. I think if that anything, DOT has of oversight buildings. on the capacity of the shed, right? Uh, Unless it says it in the criteria, then we don't. May I just? No. Actually, capacity of the shed is not is it's the dimensions of the shed. So the dimensions of the shed limit your 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 capacity as as the operator. May I just uh, offer something here? There are so many issues relating to this uh, operation beyond the DOT. There are valid concerns with regard to their DOB you know, actions with regard to the Department of Health. I mean, to the extent that you know uh, they are prepping and storing food unpermitted, mind you, in a garage. Um, that could conceivably actually shut down the restaurant. So to allow them to build a shed to expand their operation fourfold seems seems like putting the, the cart before the horse. I mean, granted that committee members, you know, have not come out to see the space or speak to the operators, but perhaps you could. In the meantime, while all of this is being put forward to our electeds, being put forward to the agencies. Perhaps this agency could consider putting, you know, just slowing down until these things get sorted through and the committee considers what is the best action. 
as opposed to allowing them to move forward, to build their shed, and then you know this the the residences are faced with this situation by an operator that is violating so many other rules, you know, that are even more significant. Right. I mean, the reality and Kevin, I, I, I respect I respect your point, but the 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 purpose of the board too is to take what the community brings us and then mm -hmm. react to that, right? So mm -hmm. um and you know SLA, I mean, like, I don't visit all the, the, the bars aren't even open yet that, that we're, that we're reviewing, but we have to torture the, the operators until we get the right responses to make sure that the people that live above that restaurant are not going to hear like crazy frat kids, like throwing up on their car in the morning, you know? So, so we are, we are within our right to do this, I think. And Jerry, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, uh, uh, Eric. But, yeah, I think the letter should be the statement should be to make sure the Department of Health does their inspections in Department of Buildings. If they're mm -hmm. doing well, all these activities. Well, yes, but, but it's the Transportation Committee, so I want to keep it specific. DOH and DOB have already been put on notice with this complaint. No, right. but Eric, you understand something. The license they get to put these roll size is based on the, the Department of Health H25 food establishment permit. If yeah. that part permit is found to not to be valid, they lose the right to put a, a, a um, outdoor dining. So that's what I'm just, there's, that's, it works together. So, right. Okay. That's okay. Thank you, William. So. Eric, if I, if I may just respond, I, I think that asking for further clarification on the rulemaking and, and helping, you know, define what these rules are and establish, you know, what actually is is allowed and isn't allowed i feel like that is that's what we should be focusing on rather than the specific restaurant of, if if that makes sense because i think I, in addition that we we should be supporting uh, community members and saying hey listen like these rules are still in development and all of our elected officials and agencies are looking to hear input on how to make these rules better how to make them more concrete and how to make them apply to everyone um, so I think that they'd be very willing to hear from individuals from the block association, but I don't know about, um, us commenting on the specific restaurant would be in scope, but rather saying, Hey, DOB, Hey, DOT, we should be looking into circumstances like the one that has arisen when, when considering the rulemaking. I mean, yes, but I mean, the, the best that we can do as a committee, which. Jerry will tell you we are advisory. Um, and so, you know, our power only rests in the ability of uh, our electeds to, you know, follow up on the things that we recommend by letters or agencies to, to, to um, follow up and, and citizens to, you know, <clears throat> call their elected officials and, and say, do something about this item. So in terms of this letter, um, I think, I, re I respect your, your point, Kevin. I think I'm not saying go to Taqueria and like shut them down because I don't want that to happen <laughs> either. You know, I, I want them, I want them to, to thrive and be a good business, but I also want them to be a good neighbor. And so, um, and I'm kind of putting on my SLA hat here too, because they did come to mm -hmm. the SLA and look for a, um, uh, a, a liquor license and, you know, they're, there was a long discussion. I mean, Tom Burroughs can tell you, we can look back at the, at the record. We did have a long discussion about, um, uh, you know, about this, this spot. And then, you know, look, do they, if they want to put out a little restaurant shed and it, and it fits and it's, um, I'm kind of okay with that, but if they're going to like take up the whole, block, I don't know. I think, and, Eric, and the rule he, and, he, and, he and, 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 and Ryan and the rule and, the rules, the way they are written by the city right now are not good. Right? Mm -hmm. So there's all these holes in the rules that make that have created this this particular situation. And this is not to cast aspersions, like whatever. I mean, they're doing business. They're just trying to, you know, do their business. Which I understand. So I think the best that we can do is if we want to write a letter to DOT 
I, actually, if we only wrote the letter to DOT and not the mayor and whatever, because that's another issue that we can take up when I put this on the agenda for my sins to be tortured. But if what we'll do is write a letter, write a letter to DOT asking them to review. I guess I'm making a motion. Uh, Community board one to draft the letter to Department of Transportation to review the application for uh, Takaria, Takaria uh, what is it, Takaria Rivera, and um, to ensure that they are in compliance with all. What would you say, William? Ramirez. Oh, Ramirez. 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 Sorry. Sorry. Well, I just want to say is that um, could we ask uh, the good neighbors to send us forward you some photos? That way you could have documentation. Yeah, that's that's fine. Yeah. But I'm just I'm just trying to structure like what this letter should say. As a motion, that's why I'm. Well, I'm, it's, I'm looking at you, William, because like, okay. you know, the rules. Well, <laughs> The rules that keep changing. Um, we work on the DLT, but basically, is the letter should should be requesting that um, uh, the, even though this is a Department of Transportation outdoor dining, that it's um because the license for it is the food establishment number for the uh, restaurant. So to make sure they're in compliance with these other agencies before you know before um they issue out the the, the Department of Buildings. Excuse me, Department of Transportation's outdoor dining permit, because there seems to be some issues with regarding the build out of the kitchen, which is Department of Buildings, uh, how they're prepping the food, health. Department of Health. You know, so to make sure DLT makes it sure that these uh, operations, for example, make sure DLT uh, Department of Health inspects before DLT uh, and so, Department so of Buildings. Wait, so we can't oversee all these other agencies, though. That's that I think that's not even realistic. I mean, who's going to do that? Do we have a quorum before we spend another 15 minutes on a motion? Uh, do we have quorum? Rhonda, would the DOT consider holding off until at least some of these issues get sorted out? Because as you know, it is contingent on their on the Department of Health's findings. So, so just so you know, when they did their uh, self certification, which they did do, mm -hmm. they need that number from the Department of Health and they had to have had it or they couldn't have completed the certification. So yes. they have that. So they but, have that. But Rhonda, it is highly unlikely that the Department of Health would have signed off on it had they known that they were prepping food and storing food in the garage which is not certified. They do not have a COO of it. They flat out lied to the precinct, to the police on Friday. They told them that they are actually, but they were asked about the curb cut, which now obviously if they're using the, those garages for purposes other than you know, parking their cars, they said, oh, we are in the process of, of changing the CO. There's nothing on file with regard to that. So they flat out lied. They, we've caught them in so many lies. The department, the DEP inspector was out there and found them guilty of dumping wastewater in the street. They lied to them. Oh, it's rainwater when there was grease floating all over so the top. All I can tell you, I, uh, Susan, I, you know, I hear what you're saying and you're just mm -hmm. saying more of, you know. Right, but all I'm saying is I can't answer this. This is beyond my uh, wheelhouse, okay? I'm, I'm sorry. So I but will bring this back and I will talk to the borough commissioner about it. All right, and in the meantime, could 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 the agency just hold off on the approval? Well, I know you've already. Well, I can bring that back to my uh, borough commissioner and discuss that with him. I don't have the authority to give you an answer to that question. Okay, Understood. let me, let, okay. Let me uh, clarify just... something about the license. All it means is that they they f filed the application to get H twenty five. They get the number. And that's all that's required of the Department of Transportation to do outdoor dining. It doesn't mean that they were already inspected and passed inspection. That's part of the process. So they, all it is is you filed it and you get the, the KMIS number, food establishment number, 
and that's all that's required for the Department of Transport, as when I was working with city government. Uh, so it doesn't mean that they pass all the special department buildings or or Department of Health, or Fire Department, all these other uh, agencies that, that regulate a food establishment. It just means they had filed it, uh, and the uh, Department of Health uh, is all by email, sends them, and they have the number, and that's the number they put in as their permit number. Doesn't mean they had an inspection or passed it. Um, and to well, that's how the system is set up now. So I, you know, yeah. I, I can't uh, make the rules or break no. the rules. Rhonda the has rules no on control this. on that. That's something that was set up by the mayor's office. Right. Period. So uh, to answer Ryan's question, we do not have a quorum. Uh, and A. And so. <clears throat> I, so. Now, now I'm kind of conflicted. Like Kevin and Ryan make good points. This, but this is this particular operator. Like if if I hadn't been on SLA committee, and if I didn't know, like that that happened, like whatever that was, like last spring or whatever, I'd I'd be a little less sanguine about it, but. And then that whole garage thing. I mean, I'm in food. Like I am, I'm in the food business. So like when I hear that they're like prepping in a garage, that makes me a little crazy because like I want to go do it in my basement, you know, where I have a lot of room to cook. And I'm not going to do that because, you know, there are rules. Um, and so anyway, we don't have a quorum for a letter. Um, I, it's It's a tough spot because what Rhonda is saying is that according to the paperwork and what William is, is verifying as well, is that they are in compliance regardless of, are they good neighbors? Are they bad neighbors? Is there, is it a good taco? Is it a bad taco? Or like, can I, can I get my stroller through this crowd of people? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm frustrated. I think it's, it's something that, you know, maybe as as the committee we can we can go forward and try to like rein it in. and the other thing too is just so you know even if we voted on a letter today it wouldn't get voted on until may 10th and then the letter wouldn't go out until later that week and by that time that shed's going to be up so that's just that's just another thing however i noticed the other day on a street on a restaurant just around the corner from me dob made them tear their shed down and rebuild it so, um, DOB, uh, DOT, DOT, um, their, the shed wasn't in compliance. They didn't have the right safety stuff going on and whatever. They tore the whole thing down. They just, they just rebuilt it with like, with all the proper, uh, they're, they're working on it today. Um, so. Uh, Eric, we have to be cautious because this is, a. I was just checking the internet. They got a large audience. And uh, so, whatever stuff we we want to do, we make sure uh, uh, we're not um, on the wrong side, you know. So it has to be thoughtful. Whatever decisions we make. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, you know, I know they have a million Twitter followers, and I don't really care. The restaurant <laughs> is wildly popular. That's the problem. I mean, good for them that they make a great taco. I love a good taco, but it, like at the same time, you know, don't be a, don't be a jerk. Right. I could I could uh, think of another. I'm I could just think saying of another word. If they are in compliance you know, with the city laws as it is, you know, the enforcement agencies right. that need to do the job, that's what it is. Right, right, right. You know. And, you know, a good example, and Trina, you'll remember, and probably some of the other folks, when, when Paulie G came before the SLA and they were going to open up their garage in the, I, was, was it Milton Street? I can't remember now. I mean. Noble Street. Noble Street, right. I mean, it was, you know, it was like a. 30 minute conversation <laughs> about Paulie G and whatever. But at the end of the day, Paulie G did the right thing, right? Well, he also had a liquor license. So there was that's leverage. That's true. That's here, true. there's no that's leverage. Like, that's, it's, it's really that the Wild is, West. That's it's true. Really... That's true. Anyway, so, I mean, okay, we don't have quorum for a letter. With all due respect, I, I think that you know where I stand and what I'm, I can do. And I, if you want to have a, you know, go on and have a committee conversation about this, I don't think you need me here. Yeah, I mean, Roddy, May I? If, one Roddy, thing. You did say, 
did say that you would take it back to um to the appropriate uh Borough department. commissioner gray yes For, yeah back take it back to keith uh and you know if you could just i think that's all we can do right now bring it take it to keith have him respond to us you know in a timely fashion um with um uh right that's it i mean I, that's that's really all we could do and then once we get that clarification um we could we could take it up uh, and uh, I, I don't know we're kind of stuck to be honest Rhonda, would it be helpful if the Davers on Oak Street were to put together some information and some pictures um, to when you do bring the case to him, just so that you have some of the facts laid out that we've been talking about? I know you've been listening, so, but would it be helpful if we gave you some, give you a document of some sort? I don't even want to suggest that because you're going to send me all the stuff that are due. DOB issues and Department of Health issues and no, we could keep it in scope. We could keep it just to the shed. Well, uh, so I already received. Uh, okay, um, no, I get it. I, I pictures from I don't know who exactly. Um, Iberti, right? That's her last name. Um, I, you know, I got emails from at least uh, two or three different people with pictures and descriptions, and I shared that with the inspection team. And Keith has copied on all that. So it's not okay. like I've been ignoring the material. I've re responded to a lot, uh, specifically last Friday. I was responding to a lot of these emails and I, and I wasn't making the answers up. I was going to the authorities within my agency. So, you know, I feel like you just, you want an answer that I can't give you. No, I understood, understood. Does uh, Rhonda, does the the commissioner or the borough commissioner have any discretion on the approvals of the sheds? Not to my knowledge. Um, and, we've just been faced, you know, faced with talking, you know, interfacing with mostly restaurants, but also people that have complaints. You know, we've been helping the restaurants. We've been helping the residents. Um, they want, you know, I wind up talking to many, many people through this and, and, you know, talk about the rules and all, but, um. The borough commissioner has not weighed in an opinion on whether something should be open. You know, or not open that has been handled through. It's actually a department division of uh, HICWA. Who does the. Um, construction enforcement, so right. they're actually the only. You know, unit in DOT that has the ability to like legally enforce, you know, issue summonses. Okay, um. Okay, so. I think we're stuck, unfortunately, but, um. Maybe you and I, I can talk some more tomorrow too. I don't. Yeah, let's, uh, Paul. Yeah, I mean, well, I don't know if this is helpful, but I just wanted to make the comment that um, even if we had quorum, I feel like I would be pretty uncomfortable voting on a letter right now because I feel like there's just such a jumble of different issues. And maybe if, you know, there was a presentation with photos and we could just kind of understand a little bit more. Um, that would be helpful, but it's just unclear to me exactly, exactly, you know, specifically what these, what these guys are doing wrong. Um, and, uh, I just wanted to make that point. Thanks, Paul. Um, okay. So. No letter, um, but, uh, Rhonda will follow up with Keith and inform the board. Um, and then. You know, this doesn't just because we're not writing a letter does not mean this is over. We will take up the restaurant shed issue. Um, probably in, in the fall, I think. Um, after we've seen what the summer looks like and then. Um, and then they'll hopefully the electeds will. 
um, you know, start asking, well, we'll start writing legislation that reigns in good people that are bad actors, that are bad neighbors, you know what I mean? So, I, you know, I don't know, I'm just, but we've been talking about this for an hour now, and uh, we could talk about it for another hour. Well, I think one and, one distinction to make too is a residential street versus a commercial street, sure, which we absolutely. don't. I mean, that's the, my last point tonight. And Eric, we'll send you photos, or we'll send the, the your committee photos, and we'll continue to put together information. Rhonda, we get it where where the limits are with where the laws are and what what you can do. But it would be great if you could take it to your chief and come back to us. And maybe we should all say good night, Eric. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, thanks, I, I just thanks, want to Gina. point and, out one thing in response to what you said. There, there's no official designation as to what makes a commercial street and what makes a residential street. I'm not trying to open up a can of worms, but there's like no map that gives you an official designation for that. So, you know, I've been asked that question before. Which is also why the legislators have to like write legislation that makes that distinction because it i mean if you're on oak or guernsey or whatever like you know and you drop a restaurant in the middle of that street it's like a nightmare you put it on franklin there's like a million restaurants on franklin i mean you know and rhonda you're, so maybe it's you're, a land use issue maybe it is anyway we have to end this but rhonda thank you so much for staying uh and and discussing this Kevin, I appreciate you. Paul, I appreciate you. Um, and Trina and and um, Maggie uh, and Susan, thank you. I'm sorry, you know, we couldn't resolve this, um, but we will put it on future transportation committee agendas because it looks like it's coming our way to 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 regulate anyway in some way or another. Since since SLA, it, it doesn't deal with uh, um, doesn't deal with these issues anymore, and that we don't do. DCA is not involved anymore, so um, we're going to have to figure out a mechanism to, uh, you know, to get some code on this. So anyway, with that, I thank everybody for attending and sticking in out till nine fifty one. It's like the old days where we used to yell at each other till like the end of the All right, night. Good night. All right, thanks, guys. Good night. Bye. Thank you, Eric. Sure. Thank you.